All right, so we have people hopping in. Howdy, y'all. Thanks for being a bit early. We've got 10 minutes to go until we'll start or so. Um, so we'll hang out for a bit as people filter in. Um, and I'll start dropping a few links in chat just in case anyone um, is missing some of the links for materials and things we'll be going through today. All right, yeah, it looks like we have some more people hopping in. Um, I'll just copy and chat again, just for key links as we're getting going here in five minutes or so. Um, so here's the, the shared Google Drive folder. Um, and we will, um, where we'll be sharing out, that has all the, the slides, activities, things we'll be going through today during our activities. Um, and just in case I hop out, um, I try to send in the most recent email, but I think previously I might have linked uh, a previous Zoom link. So in case I disconnect here in a second, I will be right back, but I'm going to open that other Zoom link just to check if anyone is uh, over there and hopefully direct them to this call. Um, so you are in the right place uh, right now. So just in case I leave, I will be right back.
Okay, and now we're back. And it looks like it did not kick everyone out while I was gone, so that's good. Um, <laughs> so again, we'll have yeah three or so more minutes before we get started. Thanks everyone for being early. Um, I'll grab and post again in chat with just key uh, links for resources um, for everything that we'll be going through. So here is the um, Google Drive link. Um, this is the, the share like overall bootcamp Google Drive. We'll have activities for day one, day two, and day three, but this has everything there together. Just reconfigure things as we're getting going. I do not need that anymore. So we've got one or so more minutes. Um, as we're getting going, we'll probably give a few minutes after the, the start time, but I'll push out um, just as we're getting going here, um, a kind of introductory poll via Zoom. So hopefully this pops up on your screen in Zoom. Um, this is just kind of an introduction to get to know the group. Who do we have? Um, kind of what's your background, experience level with machine learning? Um, and what's your kind of current position, um, stuff like that. So I'll, I'll leave this up for probably, you know, three, four, five minutes or so um, as we're getting going. Um, and then, yeah, I think the last question was, how do you feel about machine learning? So are you excited? Are you intimidated? Are you <laughs> confused? <laughs> um, I know I've definitely been through the range of emotions um, as I um, started during my uh, PhD, kind of learning about machine learning, trying to incorporate it into my research and uh, make it something that's actually you know, a useful tool. Um, so hopefully we'll um, kind of see where people are at. And then um, again, yeah, dive in in probably three, four minutes or so. So if you want to grab a glass of water or something, you will not miss anything. Um, I'll just leave the poll going um, as people are hopping in. As we are getting started. I'm sure there's a way to share in real time. It looks like I have to close it first before I share out, but I'll leave it open and then I'll, I'll close out and share out so we can look through the results uh, together here in a second. Again, I'll just uh, grab this link one more time just because I don't think it gives it to people who are just hopping in. Um, so this is our shared bootcamp materials link. Um, this has links to the Zoom meetings, um, to all the day one, day two, and day three materials. And I'll go through these together once we formally jump in here in a second as well. And since we do have, um, I'll leave again the Zoom, uh, the poll going for a few more minutes. Um, but in case uh, anyone hasn't already in that, um, shared link there and maybe I'll just also I'll share the screen to walk through what I'm as I'm talking through stuff. Um, so you should be yep seeing uh, Google Drive at this point. Um, in this uh, agenda and information file, if you open this up, um, there are some quick instructions for setting up 
um, and configuring Google Drive so that it um, will work for the activities that we'll jump into later today. Um, so this activity setup section, um, if you haven't already, please take a glance through that. It's basically just adding this whole folder, um, the one linked here, as a link onto your Google Drive so that we can access the data files that we'll need as we're running code later on. Um, so please take a moment to look through that if you haven't already. Um, again, we'll probably give maybe one more minute or so. Um, it looks like the participant number is flattening off, so we're probably getting uh, most people if they're hopping in, but we'll give it just one more second. Again, for anyone that's hopping in, the link that we're looking for um, should be in chat right now. I just posted it again. That should get you to this folder um, shown on the screen and then this agenda file, which I'm showing here that has these quick setup instructions. keep posting that in chat. Wish there was a way to have it continually share out every time someone hopped it, but I've not figured out how to make Zoom do that yet. Um, so yeah, it's 11.04. Why don't we go ahead and jump in and get going? So I'll end the poll for now. I'll give, looks like, yeah, just a few people have missed it. So I'll um, share that out. That should also, pop up on your screen now. Um, so just going through, you know, really quickly, just kind of reflecting on, uh, you know, who we have in the call today. So it looks like we are, you know, fairly grad student or postdoc kind of dominated. Um, this was similar to the July session as well. Um, we have, you know, 15% or so undergrad students. So welcome to, to you all as well. And then a few potential, you know, faculty or non-academic uh, non people who are hopping in to learn as well. Um, everyone is welcome. I'm glad you're all here. Um, and we will do our best to, you know, incorporate, you know, people's different backgrounds and catch everyone um, up with the activities we'll be working through, everything like that. Um, and yeah, let me just double check because I'm seeing in chat, someone is not hearing me. Can uh, anybody hear me? <laughs> I assume yes, but um, I'll also type in chat. So, okay, so some people can hear me. So it sounds like um, uh, long, long, that is uh, potentially an issue on your side. Um, but yeah, if you can uh, quit and re-enter, I apologize yeah, for any technical difficulties, but it sounds like uh, uh, most people can hear me, so that's great. Um, and then just to, yeah, talk through, you know, the level of experience. So, um, you know, a good chunk of people, this is like your first time really learning about machine learning. Um, that is awesome. I'm super excited to um, introduce some of these concepts, to walk through, you know, hands-on, what does this actually look like when we do this? Um, when we you know, run, build a machine learning model, train a model. Um, some people have maybe you know, been through a few tutorials and then we have you know, a handful of people that you know, have done this a little bit more or um, potentially you know, use machine learning and research before. Um, definitely uh, what I'm trying to encourage for, for these bootcamp sessions, this is very much meant to be interactive, um, answering questions, um, there is a lot of content and, you know, we will have to kind of pick and choose things we talk about, but if there's a specific interest of yours, a specific question, um, please, you know, put that in chat. I'll be, you know, keeping chat open and, and answering questions as we go. Um, and just to, to circle back to this quick question in chat, yes, we are recording right now. And in the shared Google Drive, um, there is that recordings folder. After each day, I'll go upload there. Um, I'll also upload to a separate YouTube channel and share out that link at the end of uh, the bootcamp overall, um, just for a slightly more processed version, but I'll upload the, the raw Zoom recordings into Google Drive just for anyone that wants them um, on hand for their own personal use. Um, and the same thing for all the materials. We'll, we'll leave those up. Um, those are freely you know, accessible. It's all public data um, and resources. So you are free to use uh, anything that is useful and interesting for you. Um, and then, yeah, we have a good distribution looking at the third question here, you know, excited, curious, um, a few people confused, intimidated. Um, definitely, I, I, as I mentioned a second ago, you know, I've been in that camp before. There's a lot of terminology. There's a lot of concepts out there. There are plenty of things that, you know, I still do not know about machine learning. And I've been you know, doing this for a few years. 
Um, and so I think it's a constant process of trying to you know, stay up to date with what are the like state of the art methods. Um, it feels like you know every six months there's this massive change in what people are doing and new models that are published. So um, it definitely feels like a field you know that is very uh, active and growing and um, takes a lot of kind of effort to stay up to date on. So that is definitely a, a common place to be. Um, so thank you everyone for for responding and. Um, uh, and giving your, your opinions and thoughts there. Um, so I'll close out of the poll um, and I'll go back to sharing my screen really quick as we're getting started um, for uh, a quick kind of overview of um, you know, what we are hoping to do with the bootcamp, uh, structure, expectations, stuff like that before we really jump in. Um, so you should be seeing, I think that um, Google Drive screen again. Um, and just as a, a, you know, one more time going through, you know, there are day one, day two, day three activities here um, for all the slides just to show. So these are the slides I'll be going through. And then all the activities are contained in um, the notebook file here. IPYNB is this Python notebook. Um, and this contains all the activities we'll be looking through. Um, so I'll shift over to those slides. Um, hopefully they should be, you know, 30, 45 minutes long for just me kind of talking. And then we'll get into the hands-on stuff. Um, again, answering questions, going through and, and kind of seeing what this looks like. Um, so let me shift over into present mode here. And let me rearrange my windows a little bit, just so I can kind of see everything at a glance. Um, all right. So uh, welcome to yeah our machine learning for materials bootcamp. So I'm Ben Offerbach. I maybe should have led with that a second ago. Um, I'm a postdoc here at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I'm working with Professor Dane Morgan, um, and just to give a little bit uh, of you know my background and, and motivations for um, running this bootcamp, we um, are very focused on undergraduate research. Um, so we're um, leading undergraduate research projects in machine learning and data science, um, you know, tied into materials um, and the main motivation for us of putting together this boot camp is trying to um, you know train undergraduates give out information help people get started um, obviously as we said a second or yeah when we looked through the introductions a second ago you know we are quite kind of a grad student postdoc heavy but you are also welcome as well hopefully it will still be kind of useful and interesting um, for you um, but definitely we're targeted towards you know introducting materials um, and trying to kind of be at the undergrad undergrad level to get everyone involved um, well, our overall goals, you know, we'll be trying to introduce, you know, these high level concepts um, for material science, machine learning research. Um, as I also mentioned a second ago, we you know, won't get to cover everything. Um, we'll get some hands on experience with some common Python packages. We'll hopefully then kind of spark your interest to identify, you know, here's a specific uh, model technique method that maybe is applicable for your research or for your um, activities that you can then um, you know, pursue further learning in. Um, and then hopefully also we'll, you know, connect to, you know, a network of um, other machine learning researchers. As I mentioned, the undergraduate research group we lead here at UW, um, something new we are trying this fall is we're really trying to also, you know, bring in people into this community outside of the University of Wisconsin. Um, so I'll be sharing out some materials towards the end of the boot camp. If you are, you know, looking for people to ask questions um, of and um, really looking to like build those skills in a group. Um, you know, that is something we're trying to uh, push on as well. Um, and everyone is welcome to join that if you're interested. Um, here's our overall boot camp agenda. Um, so the themes across the, the three days we have, we'll be trying to structure ourselves around different data types. Um, so for day one, we'll be focusing on um, one, just an introduction to machine learning, but we'll be focusing on what we refer to as tabular data. So basically just data that can be opened in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, day two, we'll be looking at image data and looking through, you know, what kind of models are useful for processing images um, and identifying, you know, objects and images, doing all these um, deep learning uh, tasks related to that. And specifically, we'll be focusing on um, convolutional neural networks as kind of the focus for day two. Um, and then day three, we'll be looking at natural language processing and how can we potentially do um, data extraction from uh, large amounts of text data using, you know, state-of-the-art um, tools. Specifically, we'll be using, you know, chat GPT um, and similar tools like that and showing how do we actually use those to accomplish useful things um, to like support our, our research. Um, so those are the, the themes across the day. Um, I also highlighted, you know, a few key um, tools at the bottom here that we'll be using um, as we are going through each day's activities. Um, and then the, yeah, the, I, 
think I skipped over for day one for kind of methods. What we'll be focusing on um, is featureizing material science data and then assessing the machine learning models that we'll build as well. Um, and so that fits into our kind of you know, introduction uh, information. Um, I mentioned this a second ago, but just to, to you know, say again, um, this is really meant to be you know, a useful, or this is meant to be an interactive session. Um, obviously there's a lot of us here. Um, so I maybe won't get to every single question that's uh, answered or asked in chat, but I'll try to answer you know, as many questions as I can. Um, the, from my perspective, the thing that really makes this kind of bootcamp useful is when people are you know, asking questions, having discussions, um, and not just making this be just like a boring, you know, three hour lecture about uh, machine learning, um, because there are plenty of those on YouTube that you could also go look up um, from people who can probably, you know, put together a much better lecture than I can. But hopefully that interaction really brings the uh, the value for these kinds of things. So I definitely want to, you know, push uh, everyone to, to ask questions. Um, if you know the answer to someone else's question, feel free to, you know, respond to their question as well and give your thoughts. Um, and hopefully we can you know, all learn together as we're going through. Um, the other thing that I'll throw out that I, I don't know if I called attention to um, previously is that in addition to these specific times, so this three hour chunk of time, um, for tomorrow and Thursday, um, before the boot camp, we will also have this um, like help desk kind of office hours type of session. Um, so I'll basically be hopping in as a separate Zoom call. Um, you are free to drop by those if you're looking for a more detailed kind of one-on-one -on -one discussion of, of some topic. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties with like running the activities, we can like circle back and make sure you're set up with those. Um, so uh, you're welcome to attend all those. And um, I think, yeah, I put the times on here. That'll be for an hour. Um, is an hour and a half before this starts. Um, so it'll be a 30 minute break in between just so I can um, get things up and running, um, but you are welcome to attend those. Okay, and I think that is all of my, you know, basic overview stuff um, for the bootcamp overall. Um, so now we'll dig into our, you know, introduction to machine learning for material science. Um, and the two things that I hope you know people will take away, we you know mentioned a, a lot of us are kind of starting really from ground zero. And the first question I think we want to answer is you know what is machine learning? Like what do we mean when we say we're you know, building machine learning models or we're doing machine learning? And I'll kind of propose that you know machine learning is a tool to find patterns in large data sets. Um, there are many other tools that can do this as well. And machine learning is one approach that we can use um, to tackle these kind of tasks. And specifically the types of things that oftentimes you know, come up for material science is we're trying to accelerate existing research. Um, so maybe we have a workflow, we have like 10 steps we need to do to, to take some data and get to um, some sort of uh, model prediction. Maybe we have a, a separate model that we've trained. Um, so machine learning sometimes can help accelerate those kind of workflows. It can help us do materials design. So oftentimes we can build machine learning models that predict specific materials properties, and that can help us you know, design new materials. Um, and then also similarly, uh, you know, do materials discovery. Um, so it can help, you know, make useful predictions and guide experimentalists um, along to, you know, be more efficient in their research. Um, that is not everything that it can do, but we'll, um, in the, the effort of, of making this approachable, um, we'll kind of constrain ourselves to that thinking. And that's a lot of the examples that I'll be going through um, throughout the slides and then the activities as well. Um, again, breaking up kind of what we'll be thinking about today and then also tomorrow and Thursday. Um, the, the theme and the focus uh, for today is you know, using materials property data to make predictions about new properties um, and then potentially replacing uh, physical models with these you know, correlated data centric models, which would be our machine learning models. Um, and then again, tomorrow we'll be trying to think about you know, interpreting and extracting data from images and text respectively. Um, and one thing I want to you know, throw out there, which I think is worth considering, is that um, you know, these first tasks here, you know, using materials property data to make new predictions, this is not a new idea overall. Um, you know, this was in some sense very similar to the fundamental ideas that drove the uh, construction of the periodic table. You know, so when we learn about, you know, the history of the periodic table, we're filling in different elements in this grid. Um, and you, you know, one thing that you know, stands out to me as I think back on it is that, you know, they were able to predict like, hey, there is a gap in the periodic, ta periodic table here. There is an element that's missing. This is almost exactly what we would think of as a you know, data centric kind of machine learning task that we might do today. We'd say, hey, we have a data set of 
10,000 materials, where are the gaps in this data? Where are the materials that are missing that can potentially you know, revolutionize engineering and science? Um, so all of the, the big picture ideas are very similar, but the specific methods, tools, and models being used you know, are very different. Um, and so um, obviously this is a field uh, that is you know, rapidly growing. Um, there was a, a review paper that one of our group members put together a, a few years ago, just looking at you know, publications per year. Um, and so I, I was kind of astonished when I looked at this graph the first time. Uh, but we look at you know, the, the number of publications, you know, they're you know, rapidly exploding you know, year to year. There's, I think, you know, probably well over 3,000 uh, per year at this point. Um, and the number of things that are driving this, um, we can maybe break down into three categories just to kind of understand um, what is uh, driving this change. Um, and the first thing is the tools that are out there. Um, so, you know, just, you know, five, six, seven years ago, um, a lot of what we had to do was, you know, much more like, uh, you know, writing scripts from scratch, um, using, uh, you know, really like writing our own models. Um, whereas now we are transforming uh, very quickly into a, a situation where there are state-of-the-art tools that are out there um, that can just do incredibly powerful tasks for us and they can often be used to um, accomplish the, the task that we are looking to do. Um, so I'm specifically calling attention to this you new know, Dolly 2 model. This is a text to image generation model. Um, maybe not as specifically uh, applicable to material science, but you know this is something that you know, five years ago, we would have said like, that's not possible. Um, so there are just fundamental new things that are available with existing tools. Um, and oftentimes, and, and I think we've seen, especially very recently, um, there are entire, you know, papers being published that is basically like, you know, we used chat GPT to try to do something interesting um, for material science. So there are like papers out there that have done this, as opposed to like, we, you know, coded up our own specific uh, model. Um, it's like, we're using this model, this tool has been published um, and doing cool new things with it. Um, this is also driven by, you know, just the amount of data. So I, you know, put a few, um, uh, uh, databases and data sets uh, that I found useful uh, and you've used in the past um, here. Um, but just the amount of data that is available to train to to find these patterns in is increasing, you know, just as rapidly. And so um, the types of things we can do with that um, grow alongside the available data. Um, and then tied into that, the available computing power, you know, is also increasing. Um, so this is just looking at um, kind of average uh, super supercomputing power, you know, across the years. This goes back to 1995, this plot on the right. Um, and we can see this is, you know, orders and orders of magnitude more computing power that we have access to. So this means the models we can use are uh, more sophisticated, um, the speeds that we can run them at, the amount of data we can process, you know, grows alongside the available data. And all of this means that, you know, we can tackle these problems that previously just were completely inaccessible. Um, so one of the, the um, you know, really cool breakthroughs um, was this um, basically solving of the, the um, protein uh, structure problem, essentially. So you can, you know, at this point, um, basically, you know, compute these protein structures, have your models uh, predict what protein structures should be. Um, and previously, this would have been, you know, something that was purely an experimental task where you had to um, you know, spend years and years and years of research to try to extract these proteins and analyze them. Um, and now it's, you know, basically at, you know, um, uh, at the tips of our, you know, fingers as we're looking through um, the specific application. And I just want to circle back one more time to this idea and, you know, the statement of machine learning is pattern matching. Um, again, calling back to, to you know, ways that we might, uh, you know, think about this at a, at a high level. Um, and so we can think about this plot of atomic radius versus atomic number. So again, similarly, kind of pulling trends out of the periodic table. Um, so if we we're looking at this trend across the periodic table, um, you know, there's a few patterns that quickly emerge just with this um, relationship between these two specific features. Um, one is that, you know, atomic radius tends to increase as atomic number increases. So there's this kind of linear trend. Um, and then there's also this like sawtooth pattern where it's increasing and then decreasing um, and then it jumps up and then it decreases again. Um, and each of these color bands, um, as you maybe you have guessed, um, are the rows in the periodic table. 
Um, so there are these uh, sharp transitions as you go from the end of row, one row you know, down to the next row um, that the atomic radius increases. Um, and the idea that there are these you know, multiple patterns that are existing, this is the type of information that we hope you know, the machine learning models will pull out for us. So if we you know, trained a model to predict the atomic radius and only gave it the atomic number, it would help hopefully pull out those patterns for us and give us these accurate predictions. Um, so again, this is just trying to give a few different examples for you know, how uh, to think about you know, what machine learning is actually doing. Um, now I'll kind of jump into a few more specific details. Um, that help where I've been talking about, you know, at a very big level about um, big ideas about you know, what machine learning is. And now we'll start to narrow down into like, what are we going to be looking at today for our examples? Um, so one key differentiation of the types of machine learning that is out there um, that is worth understanding is supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. Um, so supervised learning um, is the idea that we are finding this function that represents the data. Um, so this red line um, of taking you know, some sort of input data shown in the blue dots here. Um, and it's taking the input data, which we'll just call X in general, and it is making some prediction of um, the output that we care about. Um, so this could be like a materials property. Um, this could be like a, a, a type of material. So you could predict like classes of materials. Um, and we generally refer to those as the labels of the data set. Um, so if you know, you know, you have a data set, again, of maybe 10,000 materials, you have a bunch of properties about them, and then you have one that you're interested in predicting. Um, you know, that's what you would refer to as the label or the output um, from your model. Um, that's what we'll be mainly focusing on in our examples today. Um, another big class of models is referred to as unsupervised learning. Um, so in that case, um, what you'll notice from the plot here is that we don't have any labels or output data. Um, so we just have um, X's in this case. So I've, I've drawn two specifically, you know, X1 and X2. This would be two um, you know, inputs to our model. Um, so instead, what these models try to do, instead of predicting a, a specific property or, or something like that, is they try to identify structure in the data. Um, so oftentimes they'll do things like this, where they draw circles around different groups of data points and they say, you know, here's a cluster of the data. Um, so some of the, the kind of words you'll hear there associated with this are clustering models. Um, those are a very common unsupervised learning model. Um, so they don't make these predictions about, you know, materials properties, but they'll tell you, you know, here's three classes of materials. We don't know what they are because they're unlabeled, um, but it has identified them as distinctly separate. Um, the next major uh, kind of distinction that I'll focus on here um, is between regression and classification. So these both, again, fall under um, supervised learning. Um, if we think about regression models, this is saying we're going to make a prediction of a continuous variable. Um, so I'll throw out you know, three examples here. There's the, the band gap example. You could predict um, the band gap value, you know, zero electron volts up to maybe 10 electron volts. Um, you could predict the strength of a material, maybe the fatigue strength. Um, so you predict, you know, between 50 and 200 megapascals. Um, on the other side, you could do classification. Um, and oftentimes these are aligned. So you might have one data set and there's like two different ways to view the data. Um, so these are, these are distinctly paired up here where instead of predicting the band gap, um, you could instead predict, is this material an insulator? Is this material a conductor? Um, potentially you could add a third class, you know, is this material a semiconductor, for example? Um, and similarly with fatigue strength, you might be able to predict, um, you know, the type of failure that's going to occur. So is this going to be a brittle failure or a ductile failure? Um, these would be ways we could use similar data to do different things with them or uh, build different types of models with them, maybe I should say. Um, so talking about types of models, um, there are you know, many, many, many types of models that we could dive into. Um, in the interest of you know, constraining ourselves to something that is very fairly similar, or sorry, fairly simple to uh, kind of understand visually, um, for the activities for day one, we'll be focusing on decision trees and random forests. Um, so these are two models that fall under the category of what we call tree-based models. Um, a structure of a, a decision tree is shown on the right here. Um, so the idea behind a, a decision tree is it is a series of binary um, divisions within uh, the model. So we'd like start at the top um, and work our way down through each of these decision nodes. Um, and 
eventually we'd get to a, a leaf node and that's where a prediction would be made. Um, and let's see, I see a question. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to put those in the public chat as well, but I see one that was directed specifically at me. Um, I don't think I'm understanding specifically, uh, we're saying Markovnik, sorry, Markovnikov models are stated here. Um, I am not familiar with that specifically, the specific model you're referencing there. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm referencing, you know, this is, uh, in some sense, like every model we could think of could fall under this you know, list here. Oh, I see, uh, hidden Markov model. Um, yes, I think that would fall under here. Um, I might have to go double check that, but I believe so. Um, so the idea is, yes, there are, there are many, many types of uh, models which conceptually can again, are doing similar things. They're looking for patterns. They're taking some kind of input data and then giving us some predictions. Um, and yeah, we'll be thinking about specifically these tree-based models. Um, so um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and then the last, I think, distinction that I will um, call attention to here before we kind of dive into um, some of the activities here in a second is this idea between kind of traditional learning and deep learning. Um, so for today's activities, again, we'll, we'll think of um, everything we're doing is kind of traditional machine learning in the sense that the models are uh, have a fairly low amount of adjustable parameters, which means they train very quickly. Um, they um, are usually yeah, training quickly, they're easy to retrain, and oftentimes they're a good kind of starting point unless we know we need to use um, a deep learning model which would take you know, significantly longer to train um, or often tune much more towards like larger data sets um, and more complex uh, kind of situations. And I'll jump back here because there's yeah, another question. So a good question in chat, are these models only for supervised learning? Um, so I think the ones that I've listed here would be for supervised learning, yes. Um, and I, I point out, and maybe I'll just kind of show off really quick just to um, hop out of the uh, presentation mode really quick. Um, so I put this you know, link here, and you can also throw this in chat just in case anyone's interested to, to look as well. Um, oops, I'll just get a, I'll open this up. So this is a, a reference specifically to this uh, specific Python package called scikit-learn, which is you know, very useful for many of these model types that you know, standardized a lot of these you know, common models. Um, so if we're interested in looking through you know, all of the supervised learning, uh, or so I, I shouldn't say all, I should say you know, a large amount of the supervised learning models that we might be interested in, um, those are all uh, listed here in the scikit-learn documentation. Um, so all of the code we'll be running today will be using these models specifically from scikit-learn. Um, so you'll see you know, a number of the ones and some different variations of those that I listed in the slides. Um, scikit-learn I can definitely you know, recommend is a, a nice uh, place to start and um, usually has really nice kind of explanations for their models. So if you're wondering you know, what are any of these models, they oftentimes have a, a nice kind of text description um, visualizations of kind of what's going on, as well as some examples of, you know, here's some quick code if you're looking to implement them and you know, try them out. Um, so maybe we'll just kind of throw that out there as a, a useful place to, or a useful thing to know that exists, especially if you're you know, getting started. I'll jump back over here to the slides. Um, so as I was talking through a second ago, um, yeah, so uh, thinking about, you know, traditional learning versus deep learning, um, the, the really big difference is in kind of you know, how, how fast they train, which then limits, you know, what can we do with them? Um, so again, oftentimes the starting point is we'll think of these, you know, um, simpler models uh, that we can train quickly, we can learn from, and then we can, you know, maybe shift to using deep learning if we need to um, for a project that, you know, isn't uh, accessible with these traditional learning techniques. Um, so again, just the, the quick summary, um, at a high level, you know, machine learning is this tool for finding patterns and data sets. Um, we will, you know, show in a second how it, you know, fits into these material science workflows, how it accelerates research, how we do materials design um, and materials discovery. Um, and then we, 
you know, are focusing again on these like supervised learning and regret. Uh, regression techniques for today specifically. Um, we might also point out some ideas about how we could shift to classification as well, um, if we have time. So um, that is, again, just the my quick introduction. I know that was a lot of uh, uh, material there. So I'll take just a moment to pause and see, um, again, if there are any other questions. Um, for a lot of the specifics of like what the, the models look like, we'll also get a chance to again, see those in the activities. Um, so I'll try to maybe explain in a little more detail or answer any kind of more nuanced questions about the models there. Um, but if there's anything else that's on anyone's mind to let me know before we jump into the next little section here. Yeah, so it's a great question um, about the band gap specifically. Um, and we'll actually talk a little bit in more detail about band gaps because that is our example that we'll be going through today. Um, so the question, yeah, is wouldn't the classification involve a band gap prediction? If we're going to say, um, uh, you, you could think of this as, you know, if the model predicts, um, you know, zero EV that, and essentially says there's not a band gap, that would be equivalent to saying it's a prediction of a conductor. Um, and yes, you could set up a model that does that. You could basically use a regression model and then layer our own you know, scientific knowledge on top of that and say like, okay, when it predicts zero, we will just take that zero output and you know, transform that to classification or, or to conductor. Um, and then like anything above a certain EV, we'll say that's an insulator and then we'll define a range that is semiconductor, for example. Um, so that's certainly valid. Um, the thing that I, I'm pointing out here is there are you know, different structures of models that are fundamentally doing different tasks. Um, so there might be a situation where um, we don't even, we don't have access to the band gap values themselves. Maybe the experiment we did um, to generate this data, you know, didn't give us an accurate band gap value. It was like, um, you know, it only gave us the, this really rough approximation. And so in that case, maybe we don't trust the regression data enough and there's too much noise in it. And maybe we think like, okay, in that case, we'll just, shift just to classification. Um, so I think it would fall into like specific situations, but certainly I think what you proposed is, is a reasonable thing um, that we could do. Um, and then yeah, a more like big level question. So it's, it's great to think about what kind of program like programming language are necessary to learn um, for machine learning. Um, I'd say from my experience, I've worked like 99% in Python. Um, that I, not to say that that is like required. I think that is kind of a personal preference. I think other languages that are popular or the other big one that comes to mind for me would be R. Um, so Python and R, if, if someone's kind of starting from scratch would be two, I'd say like, okay, you know, that would be a good starting point to, to look at those two. Um, but I have never run into a situation where I couldn't do something in Python that I wanted to do um, for working with machine learning. So that might be you know, my default that I would recommend. Uh, another great question, are unsupervised learning methods more practical and popular in big projects compared to supervised? Um, say in material science, which method is more dominant? Um, it is, I think, so yeah, to answer your question, which method is more dominant? Um, I don't think I have a good answer for that. Um, so I'll, I'd be just, I think, speculating because um, I haven't looked through in, in kind of detail. I think from my personal experience of things I've done, like almost everything that I've done has been supervised learning. Um, so my personal bias is I would say like, oh, it seems like supervised learning is, is more dominant, but I don't think that that's actually the case. Um, I think there's probably a, a fairly good balance. Um, the thing that would um, change between these two is in you know, what kind of tasks are we trying to accomplish? So um, oftentimes, you know, my motivation and how I've been you know, thinking about this is we are trying to you know, predict specific materials properties. That's like a, a big uh, overlying goal. Um, I think in just material science as a whole, like one of the, the fundamental things that would be like amazing to be able to do is to like come up with a material in your head and say, you know, what do I think some property is going to be? You know, I think I want to dope my material with some new um, element. Like, how's that going to change the properties? 
Um, and so we might have you know, ways to think about that. Um, so a machine learning model that could kind of tell you, here's an approximate you know, change to your materials property when you dope this thing, or when you, um, you know, substitute an element for another, when you change the structure, um, that is a very, I think, powerful thing. Um, so that all falls under like supervised learning because, you know, we need to know the properties and train towards those properties to do those kinds of tasks. Um, but I think unsupervised learning definitely exists as well. If we have, again, data where we're not sure what the labels are, like we don't have those properties we're interested in. We're just like, here's a bunch of materials that we, I don't know, maybe there's like a, a super high throughput experimental process that's out there where you're like sputtering these large amounts of materials. And you're just like, I made you know a bunch of materials using different experimental conditions. I don't know really what I made. I'm trying to rapidly characterize them. You know, that might be a situation where unsupervised learning might be useful because that will like cluster them all and say, you know, here's all these similar materials that you made and you can look in more detail at them. Uh, so that might be a way I think of you know, unsupervised learning being useful. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a great question and, and something to be thinking about. Um, and so um, here's one that's maybe a little bit easier. So yeah, if you'd like to predict whether a material is a conductor or not, should you use unsupervised learning or clustering? Uh, no, if you, if you know and you have a training data set where you have you know, a labeled data set where you, know, you have like, uh, you know, silicon and you have its label, like, is it a, a conductor or an insulator? You know, that fundamentally is supervised learning because you have that label there. Um, and we'll show in a second, like what that looks like in the data. Um, um, so yeah, scanning through some of the other questions. Um, you notice there are too many models. <laughs> there are certainly a lot of models and it is, I think, very intimidating to like look through and try to identify what would be useful um, uh, or what to, to start with maybe. So oftentimes I think, you know, the, the starting point is um, looking through, you know, the previous literature, like what models have worked for people, um, trying to use that as maybe inspiration is always a good place to start. Um, and then calling attention to, I think tied into that question, yeah, have language models been used um, to research which method applies. So you're thinking of like scanning through papers and seeing, basically using it to do um, a more like advanced literature search. I think there are people doing that right now, I think. Um, I don't know if I've seen anything specifically published, but I know of at least one person in our group that is like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna use chat GPT to like feed in a bunch of papers and see if I can pull out. Um, some useful like summaries of like what people are doing, basically, you know, accelerating their literature search. Um, so I think that is a, a, a thing people are thinking about. Um, there's another question, what output will we get, for example, in the band gap prediction case, will the output just be an empirical equation and will you have to interpret it? That's a great question. Um, so yeah, the, uh, I think this will become apparent when we start looking through the examples, um, but fundamentally the, the prediction is, is the value itself. Um, so the prediction here, like I've shown here, um, on the left side, the prediction would just be, you know, 5.5 EV, you know, 4 EV. It would be specifically the number, um, that we have set up and we have used, um, during the training process. So it, it does not by default give us you know, here's the complex equation that you need to then go interpret or something like that. Um, oftentimes, that is something people might be you know, interested in. It might be for some specific models, they might be able to do something like that. Because um, sometimes we're interested. We, we want to know like, okay, you predicted, you know, 5 EV for the band gap, but why did you predict that? Um, so there's this, this whole concept of interpretability um, that is sometimes a, a big concern for machine learning, right? Because we have this you know, black box where we feed in all this input data and it just starts spitting out predictions and we don't really know how those came about. Um, so oftentimes that's a, a kind of benefit if a model can also give you a prediction or a, a, some sort of uh, interpretability of like how it made that prediction, maybe yeah, with an equation or something. Oops. Yeah, it's a, a great question. Um, ba -ba -ba. And um, I think maybe I uh, gave this something that was similar to this a second ago, but an experience with unsupervised learning. So um, like I said, I'm not uh, as uh, directly uh, experienced with that in some of my research, but my thoughts for yeah, a quick example would be 
yeah, if you were doing this like high throughput synthesis and you said, you know, I've made 1000, uh, you know, new tiny little samples and I need to rapidly characterize them. So maybe you, um, you know, collect some experiments, some data on them, uh, on all of your samples. So you have a few um, kind of input features, but you don't really know what you made. Um, so you're trying to then like cluster all of those into different groups and say like, you know, here's certain input settings that all formed one type of material. Here's one for another type. Um, and then you can go do a more detailed experiment to understand like what exactly did I make? Um, that might be one way that that fits into like a experimental workflow. Um, and you see, yeah, there, here's a, a good question. Um, what is more accurate, supervised or unsupervised? Um, in the sense, there's, I think, a few ways to answer that. I think overall, there, I don't think one is more accurate than the other. I think they're doing different tasks, um, and one is giving more information to us because we are giving the model more information. So supervised learning, we are giving it, again, these, these labels, these output data. In this case, we're thinking of them as you know, these materials properties that we want it to predict. So it has knowledge that the unsupervised model does not have. And so in that sense, the predictions are, are more accurate because we've given it more information. Um, but in the sense of just like for the types of tasks you'd want to do with these models, I don't think one is like more reliable or something like that. Um, generally though, I'd say, you know, when you can do supervised learning, um, when we have the data for it, you know, that is generally, I think the preference. Um, again, because you're giving it more data, it can be more accurate in that sense for those uh, for the things you're trying to do. All right. Um, I think I maybe missed a few questions here. So let me look at the time really quick. I think in the interest of time, we'll try to keep things moving forward. So these are all great questions. I'll try to circle back um, maybe during like the break and answer these in um, via text. Um, some of the ones I missed, so I'll scan back through. Um, so really great questions, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for those. Um, we will I have a few last slides to wrap up before we jump into the hands-on activities. And then maybe some of the questions also will be answered as we start to see kind of hands-on how things are working. Um, so I wanted to give a few slides just kind of introducing today's example and today's data um, and what this actually looks like uh, for one concrete example. Um, and so we've been, you know, people have been asking a little bit about some of the band gaps because I you know, gave that on the previous slide. So that is the example that we'll be going through today. Um, the the uh, you know goal that we'll set ourselves is we are trying to, or we'll you know, think about in the background is, you know, we are trying to synthesize a material that will be an efficient solar cell. Um, so like a single junction solar cell. Um, depending on, on your background, this might be something you're, you're familiar with or not. Um, but just to um, hopefully catch everyone up to speed, um, the, the band gap of a material is something that tells us about the electronic properties of the material and like the electronic states that electrons can occupy. Um, so shown on the right here is this schematic diagram um, where we have these you know, blue boxes and red boxes. Um, so these are meant to represent um, electronic states in a material. So electrons can have different energy levels, but there are some energy levels that electrons cannot have. It's, it's physically impossible. And so when that occurs, a gap exists between these different bands, we call them. So um, the blue band, we'd call the conduction band, the red band, we'd call the valence band. Um, so when these gaps exist, um, the electrons need to jump over them by absorbing external um, energy. And the way that we think of that in the context of solar cells is it's absorbing you know, energy from the light um, that is you know, coming down onto the material. The electrons jump up into the higher band, um, they move around for a bit, and then eventually they jump back down. And so this, this state of you know, jumping across the band is absorbing and releasing energy. And so that's the whole principle be behind how solar cells kind of function and exist. Um, so you need this gap to exist in the material, and you need it to be at a very specific value. Um, so I think the value that uh, we'll be aiming for is this value of 1.4 electron volts, um, which is very high efficiency for something called a single junction solar cell. So basically a, a very simple solar cell. Um, 
if we were you know trying to approach this problem and just start searching for materials you know there is an infinite uh, possibility and, and complexity to how we could put atoms together to make a new material um, so the idea is can we use machine learning to predict um, for a very limited set of materials in this case binary compounds um, so just two elements being put together um, can we predict you know what the band gap will be when we put these different elements together um, and the thing we're trying to predict, again, is this continuous variable, the band gap here. Um, we also point out, and this ties back to, again, some of the comments that, you know, we could also do the classification version of this, where we could predict um, a metal where all the bands are overlapped and the electrons can move freely. We could predict a semiconductor where the band is the band gap is very small. Um, and that's actually the, the situation, 1.4 electron volts would be in this semiconductor region here. And then an insulator would be a band gap that's incredibly large. All the electrons cannot jump across it just because there's not enough energy. Um, and so that's the, the situation where you know, you're know you not conducting uh, electrons across in your material at all. Um, so it's kind of the, the goal and the, the background on you know, the band gap value itself. Um, if uh, you're finding that confusing, um, you can just say like, hey, this is a value. Um, a few things, uh, and you can kind of ignore the details. Um, the few things to keep in mind about it is this value will always be positive. It cannot go below zero. Um, and the, the range of values that we're kind of interested in, again, is around 1.4 electron volts. Um, anything like above three, four, five, up to like 10 um, is kind of in this insulator region. Um, and then again, zero would be a metal or a conductor. Um, so that's kind of the, the you know, big picture understanding um, if you're, you're not wanting to, to dig into all the details. Um, here's what the data looks like. So I you know, grabbed a, a subset of the data um, that we'll be looking at. Um, I'll start in the middle here and let me actually grab a little annotation thing so I can kind of draw on the screen easier. Um, Okay, so hopefully that showed up. Um, so we've been mentioning again this term, the labels or the targets. Um, so again, that is a single column in our data set. So here's all of the band gap values. They just show up, you know, as, as a single number here. Um, this is what we're going to again look for the model to train to predict um, is all the the values in this column. Um, one of the uh, key things that we'll use for input is this chemical formula. Um, so this is telling us, you know, what elements are present and in what ratios. Um, something you might note is that there's a lot of duplicates here, and so we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, and then we have a bunch of columns over here, which we're not going to use directly in our machine learning model. Um, and we refer to these as metadata. Um, so this is just information that is useful, like you know the units, um, but it's something that it can't be directly interpreted by the machine learning model. Um, we also have some experimental conditions, you know, like the method used to generate our values, and then this reliability. Um, here. Um, and then, yeah, the left, then we just have our index um, for looking through or for identifying all the materials. Um, so that's what the data looks like. Again, this kind of structure of data, if we have these just you know, columns and rows, this is what we'd refer to as tabular data. Um, so um, a large chunk of data that we'll work with kind of falls into this uh, category um, where we can essentially uh, you know, structure everything as just you know, rows and columns in a spreadsheet. Um, it looks like there's yeah, another quick question. Um, what are the main challenges or pitfalls to be aware of? <sighs> that is a, a huge question. Um, the main pitfalls. Um, this isn't all of the pitfalls, but I'll say one main pitfall is the uh, is is not being aware of the domain of your data. Um, so I mentioned a second ago, and I maybe should have called more attention to it, but the data that we're working with is, you know, binary compounds. So, so all the data we have has two elements in it. Um, they're in, you know, very specific ratios. You can see here, they're, you know, 50-50 ratios. If we trained this model and then went and tried to predict, um, you know, a band gap for a material that was, you know, that had five elements in it, we would not expect that the model would perform well um, because the domain that it's been trained in is very limited. It has only ever seen the existence of these binary compounds. It has no you know, concept of any other type of material or 
way to you know combine elements. Um, so the domain of applicability of models is something that uh, I think is hard to um, understand a lot of the time and could really get us into trouble because we can start making predictions very rapidly about things that the model really is not suitable for. Um, and if we don't properly assess the model, that can be you know, very dangerous. So, um, so that's, that's one thing I'll point out there. Um, another good, quick question, why can't we use um, a like one hot encoding uh, method for the data? Um, there's no reason that we can't. Um, so that is one strategy we could try. Um, we, uh, for the example that we'll be going through today, if you wanted to try one hot encoding the data and you're, you know how to do that, you definitely could. Um, we chose a slightly different approach to featureize the data, um, but there's nothing fundamentally stopping us from doing that. Um, Let's see. And there's a few other longer questions here, um, which I'll talk through. Some of these I think I'll answer in a second. And again, I'll try to circle back um, in the break to maybe answer some of these other ones. Because um, hopefully we'll take a break here in a second before we dive into the hands-on activities. Um, so we were talking through you know, the structure of the data. And then the, the last couple of things to introduce is you know, the structure of what we are um, going to be doing. Um, so we're thinking of this, you know, materials design workflow where we're trying to identify materials properties, in this case, the band gap, we're trying to train a pro uh, model of those properties. And then ideally we're trying to go, you know, make some new predictions and synthesize and verify those predictions. Um, what we'll be focusing on for our example today is these two kind of steps in the middle of this workflow at the bottom, um, thinking about, you know, feature engineering and model assessment. Um, so how do we, uh, featureize the data, which uh, again, there's some quick questions in chat about, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and then once we featureize, once we've actually trained a model, how do we know that the model is working correctly? And what are, uh, again, some common things that kind of come up when we're training models? Um, so hopefully that's what we'll be focusing on. Um, for some of these other steps, just to you know, throw out, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, section, you could have a whole discussion about generating data and data cleaning as well. Um, and then we could also talk about, you know, model optimization, how do we, you know, update and, and uh, optimize our models in the interest of trying to, you know, not spread ourselves too thin. That's why we'll be focusing on these two kind of middle steps here. Um, but I'm happy in the help desk to, to talk through any of these other steps if people are interested as well. Um, so featureization, um, again, someone just asked about one hot encoding. That's definitely something we could also do. That would be a, an alternate way to featureize models. Um, the whole idea behind featureization is we have this input composition. Um, so this list of um, uh, the elements that are present and in what quantities. Um, the model doesn't know what that means. We need some way to turn that into like a computer readable uh, format. Um, and one way that we do that is we just turn that into numbers. Um, so the strategy that we'll use for featureization is we'll um, featureize the compositions by looking up elemental properties of all of the elements in the composition string. Um, so we have aluminum present, we have copper present in this example on the slide. So we'll look up, you know, what is the melting temperature? What is the atomic radius? Um, all of these other properties that are in existing databases. And we will use those as the input features. Um, for anyone that was, that was following along with that other question about one hot encoding, um, one hot encoding would be the idea that we don't look up specific elemental properties. We just say um, we turn this string into a bunch of new columns that are just ones and zeros that are basically a binary, um, does this element exist or not feature? So it'd be yes or no, is aluminum in this property or in this material? Yes or no, is copper in this material? And we'd go through all of the other elements as well. You know, yes or no, is nickel in this material? So for this composition, there'd be this big long vector that would just be ones and zeros for all of the elements and whether they're present or not. So it'd be, you know, two ones and a bunch of zeros basically because we have all these binary um, compounds. Um, and so we could try that. Um, and if we have time, you know, we could try doing some quick adjustments to the code to try that out or someone else, if you're feeling confident, you could try as well. Um, but we'll use again, this elemental featureization uh, technique. 
Um, and again, the idea is then we'll get to making a prediction with the material, um, hopefully close to you know 1.4 electron volts um, would be the goal. Um, the last thing I think I'll point out before we transition over the activities is how we're going to think and look at the outputs. Um, so here's a, a example of a common plot that we'll make for regression um, called a parity plot. Um, so a parity plot is showing the predictions from a machine learning model on one axis versus the experimental data that it was trained on on the other axis. Um, so we have predictions. Um, this is this E, G, comma, S, V, R on the y-axis here. Um, so that's the machine learning prediction. Um, in this case, they used an SVR model. This is a support vector regression uh, model. Um, and the experimental data is shown on the x-axis. So EG, EXB for experimental. Um, so when we plot these two against each other, each data point, um, we can see the errors individually um, expressed as vertical distances from this ideal line shown in the middle, which is this solid line, or sorry, this um, uh, dashed line shown in the middle. Um, so the dashed line is this like perfect prediction. So any points that are falling you know, on the dashed line, that means the prediction was equal to the experimental value. And so there's a few points you can see with larger errors that have this large vertical distance and then other ones that are close. Um, again, we'll get to look at some of these in more detail in the hands-on activity, but I at least wanted to show one ahead of time. Um, a common question, and just to, to call attention, you know, there's two lines on this plot. Um, what they also did is went back and like refit a line of best fit to this data, just to show like the deviation from that ideal line. Um, so the dashed line is y equals x, and then the solid line is a custom fit, um, just like linear regression to this data. Um, and with that, we're going to transition over to the hands-on activities. So I was trying to introduce, you know, big picture things that we'll kind of see ahead of time. Um, hopefully some of it will start to uh, make more sense as we're getting hands-on with it, because I know that's a lot of things. Um, there's maybe one or two more questions that I missed a second ago. Um, can you tell us methods that we can use to encode the inputs? Um, so yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, as we're going into the hands-on section, I'll show like where we could change that. And I'll also show um, where you could maybe look for some other examples. It would be similar, just like um, was pointed out in chats, you know, scikit-learn has a bunch of these featureization um, techniques that are all formatted similarly. So we can look at, you know, uh, maybe look through a few of those. Um, and another question, uh, so given something I just said, hopefully I'll remember what it was, how would you distinguish between uh, AL70 copper 30 and AL30 copper 70? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I skipped over the detail there. Um, what we'll be doing is looking at a composition average um, of the elemental properties. Um, so yeah, I was, I was going a little quickly and I didn't uh, explain fully. Um, so yeah, I said, we'll look up the elemental properties um, and then we will weight them by the ratio of the elements. So we'll say, you know, we have 70% copper. So we'll take 70% of the melting temperature of copper and average it with 30% of the melting temperature of aluminum. Um, to give this unique representation. Um, and yes, I'll drop in chat again um, with key links as we're transitioning to the hands-on activities here in a second. So let me shift back over um, and let me grab that link. This link is also shared in the um, file here. Let me put this in chat. Um, so this should be the shared Google Drive. Everyone should have access to this. Um, for the activities. Um, but we are, you know, about an hour in, so why don't we take a quick break? Um, we'll take, let's say, uh, 10 minutes. Um, I'll try to scan through chat and answer a few more questions. Um, and the other thing, uh, the one thing that I'll, I'll mention just again, and I'll leave up on screen here, um, there are some quick, you know, setup activities. I sent these out via email ahead of time. Um, but uh, please uh, look through this like activity setup section. It's just a few quick steps to get the data set up um, so that we can run through the activities here in a second. Um, but other than that, let's take yeah 10 minutes. I'll put a timer on screen just so we can keep track. Um, and then we'll jump back in with some of the hands-on activities here in a second. All right.
pause that and I'll start scanning through chat and I'll see if I can answer a few questions via text um, as people are grabbing water or anything else you wanna do, take a quick stand up, anything like that.
All right, we'll get going here again in just a second. Um, hopefully people are making their way back from the break. Um, thanks everyone again for the great questions in chat and for those of you helping you know, give your thoughts and, and help answer, that is super useful. Um, so yeah, I see a lot of great questions there. Um, one specifically I think I'll, I'll call attention to that I think is uh, you know, worth thinking about is, you know, if we have a model, um, you know, the, the model can take whatever input features we've set up, it can make these predictions um, about a materials property, for example, um, how do we then, you know, generate new, um, new materials? Um, so the, using just the structure we have currently, what, what we would do is we would first, um, you know, think of what are those inputs, you know, for a candidate new material. So for, like I've been um, thinking about this from the, the context of a chemical composition. What if we said, I want to increase, you know, 5% additional um, aluminum in my material, for example. You could just, you know, take your composition, increase that by 5%, then you would generate the new feature set associated with that new composition and just feed that into the model and it would you know, make its prediction for you. Um, and so that's, you know, one way that you would um, think about that. Um, if you wanted the model to just start like spitting out a bunch of predictions of new materials, um, that doesn't quite fall under the, the way that we've set things up currently, but there's definitely a uh, huge interest in doing that. And I would recommend looking into um, specific uh, subclass of models called generative machine learning models, which are, I think, more tuned to kind of doing that type of task where they will just um, kind of systematically uh, spit out new materials or new predictions um, hopefully in a guided way that is you know, useful to whoever's using it. So that might be just a, a thing to, to search around about um, those generative machine learning models. Um, we don't have anything specifically here that is calling attention to that aspect currently, um, but um, something we might think about adding if we end up you know, doing a similar bootcamp in the future. All right, so we will jump back in and we will start getting set up with our hands-on activities. Um, so again, what I'm, I'm hoping um, is that I'll be showing off some Python code um, and everyone, um, if you're able and interested, you can follow along and run the same code that I'm running. We can make edits to that code. Um, we can kind of explore things on the fly. For example, if someone has a question, you know, what happens if we change this thing? If we change a certain setting, we can just do that on the fly and kind of show how things are working. Um, if you, you know, don't want to follow along and just want to kind of watch, um, you can just watch me run the code as well. You also have access to it, so you can go back and run it later. Um, but I'll go through um, a quick version of what is on the screen right now, which is again this uh, setup, these setup instructions for um, you know, running um, the interactive code here. So I have a um, mirrored version of this um, in a private window where I'm not logged into that account. So I made a, a temporary account. So this is what things should look like if you are just uh, kind of starting from scratch here. Um, the thing that we are hoping to do um, that is in those um, these introduction uh, activity setup instructions here is we are trying to add this folder, the entire folder together um, as a shortcut onto your My Drive link. Um, onto your My Drive uh, under Google Drive, so on like the left side here. Um, so what you can do if you haven't already is you can do organize. Um, you can you know click at the top here, drop down to organize, add shortcuts, um, and then you might have this under suggested in your My Drive. You might have to go to all locations here. Um, so I'll just select My Drive, highlight it in blue, and then click add. So now if I go on the left side. Um, now this is you know permanently added or not permanently. You can remove this later if you you don't want this here later. Um, but now for now you'll see this kind of link indication, this arrow. Um, and whenever I come back to Google Drive, I'll have access to this um, directly here. Um, this will be what sets up the the file location so that the the data can be read here in a second. Um, so with that set up, you can navigate um, into the day one activities here. Um, if you've run uh, Google Colab before, if you're familiar with Google Colab, you might have it set up so that you can just double click or right click and select open with Google Collaboratory. Um, if you do that, you'll be good to go and I'll get there in a second. If you don't have that set up already, that's totally okay. Um, so you can go here, you can right click and you can go to connect more apps here. Um, so this should pop up with a quick window then you should be able to search in the top for collaboratory. 
Um, you should see this uh, one here with the orange circles. Um, if you click uh, and install this, interesting that it lets me install still. Um, I'll do this. So you should then, um, it'll say that make default, that should work. Um, so now whenever you have one of these IPYNB files, so this is a, a Python notebook file, it will automatically sync to Collaboratory, um, which is the uh, kind of interpreter for reading and interacting with these files. Um, so once you've done that, you should be able to, um, again, right click and open or just double click. Um, you should see the icon here. If that's not working for you, that's totally okay as well. Um, you can just download uh, the file and um, I'll also mirror that really quick. Um, so I'll just download, throw this into my downloads. Then you can directly go to um, your collab. Um, so you're looking for something like this. And then you should be able to, um, you should by default get this pop-up where it says upload on the right. And you can just upload manually this um, tabular data's activity IPYNB file. And so then that will open it up. And then you should see something like this. Looks like there's a, a permanent annotation on my screen. Let me see if I can close that really quick. Okay. I'll draw it. okay. Um, so, that is what things should look like. Mine is in dark mode, which I'm actually going to get rid of. Um, I think for some of the visualization later, it looks better in light mode. Um, is there an advantage to running in Colab rather than in Jupyter? Um, the advantage to running in Colab is for these specific activities, all of the um, specific setup at the beginning. So anything that we do when we're installing packages or importing packages is specific to the Colab environment. Um, you can definitely get it working on Jupyter with some effort. Um, if you're comfortable modifying environments and you know customizing things, it, it will work. Um, but I would encourage you for these activities today to run on Colab just because this will work out of the box. You won't have to do any customization um, for anything. Um, so yeah, I think it's purely for, for the environment. Um, you haven't found a way to manage the environment. Um, you should be able to install just like, uh, I don't know if we do it in this first activity, but I think, you know, pip install and, and uh, I think pip install works. Uh, Condo works with some effort, uh, but uh, if you're using like Condo environments, those are a little harder to work around. Um, but I think definitely just pip installing things works like a normal Python environment if you've done that before. Um, but certainly there are some limitations to it. Yes, every time you open the notebook, you'll have you'll if you are doing some sort of installation, you will have to run. You'll like have some code at the top that will you know do that installation. Um, hopefully, it's fairly quick. But yeah, if your if your installation takes a long time, then yes, it can be annoying to run on Colab. For again, this specific activity, um, it will run out of the box. You won't have to do anything. So hopefully, everyone is seeing a similar screen to what I'm seeing now. Um, on the left-hand side, if you haven't, you'll run on Colab before. Um, that is totally okay. We'll hopefully kind of bring you up to speed. Um, on the left side, there's kind of table of contents for things. If you're trying to jump around, I'll um, minimize this here in a second just so we can see better. I'll also probably zoom in. So I realize the text might be a bit small. Um, on the left side as well, you can see your like file structure and any files you've uploaded. Um, the way that we interact with these notebooks, if you haven't run a Python notebook before or even you know, run Python before, um, this is a combination of Python code and text. Um, so there are different cells here that I'm selecting just by left clicking. You can see the, the highlight, hopefully. Um, and I'm gonna actually minimize this. Um, so I can select different things. And if there's code in the cell, we can run the code. Um, by default, all the things are minimized. So if you click these drop down arrows, it will expand or contract. Um, so here's, for example, a, a simple um, you know, bit of Python code. If we click the play button on the left, it will you know, just run the code that's in here. Um, if you're on the text cells, um, you can you know, double click by going in 
uh, or you can edit by going in and double clicking. Um, if you do this accidentally, you should be able to just select away and it will get out of the edit mode. Um, so the thing that we are basically doing in these activities is we are going to you know, run through these notebooks. We are going to run the code as we encounter the cells. Um, we'll talk through some examples. If we want to, again, like try something out like, oh, what happens if we change this to 15? Um, we can change that on the fly. We can see we can update all of our variables. Um, the thing to uh, a kind of warning is if you start jumping around too much, um, if, for example, I add a new code block, which I can do here, um, where I say, you know, just like sort of print A, um, you know, even though this is above this, you know, this it still has this A variable in memory. Um, so you can run things out of order and sometimes get into trouble with that. Um, so everything is set right now is set up to run linearly from top to bottom. Um, at some points I might jump around and I'll try to um, explain where I'm jumping if I'm doing that. Um, but you can get into trouble if you like skip down way to the bottom and start running code. Um, for example, I'll show that if I you know just scroll way down here um, and try uh, you know doing something here, you know this is going to yell at me that you know things aren't defined, um, things aren't imported. So if you see things like this, that probably means you've skipped something ahead of time. Um, so if you're worried about that and if you're getting frustrated, um, a workaround is you can go to the top here where it says runtime and just select run all. This will do just a linear run as if this was just a Python script from top to bottom and just run everything. Um, so all your outputs will be there. Then you can kind of scroll through and kind of look at things. Um, so especially if this is your first time running Python, um, that might be a good place to start. Um, I'll be running through one by one, um, but this is totally viable as well. Um, and then you'll just have all the outputs here and you can kind of view this as just a, a static document. And then if you want to go back and play around with things later, you can. So hopefully with that, again, everyone is, um, again, having the document open, um, comfortable with what we're going to be doing here, at least a little bit. Um, and so I'll just start, uh, again, kind of running through things. Um, so that's just showing off, you know, run, doing a basic run. Um, the first thing that we're going to do here is we are then going to mount our um, uh, our Google Drive account. Um, so this gives us access to the files that we just imported. Um, so the idea here is that um, this will give us access to all of the data that is included in those files there. So we'll just ask you for some quick permissions. Um, and then once you do this, it'll take a second. Um, but if you expand on the right side here with the file directory, you'll see your Google Drive will start to show up um, here. Um, and that'll tell us, if I refresh here, that'll show like, okay, here's our drive, my drive, and then here's our notebook, or here's our uh, bootcamp files. Um, so now I have access to, again, the data file here, the band gap data, um, these helper functions. Um, this is what's needed for the activity to run. Um, so if you see that, that is uh, showing that you have successfully configured your Google Drive. Um, if you're showing something is empty, yeah, try to, you want to be in, I think that's a good point from um, Shimin. Um, if you are not in the top level directory, um, then that will be why things show up as empty. Um, so yeah, definitely the, you know, August recording directory is empty. There's nothing in there when I try to expand it. Um, but you want to have set up the shortcut in this overall uh, bootcamp directory here. So you want to have everything together. Um, that will also give, it, give you access if you're trying to look for this later on. So um, with that uh, mounted, we have all the data. Um, we'll do some um, quick imports here. This is, I think, yeah, a quick test just to make sure things are working um, and to configure some uh, variables um, for path names for, for importing data. Um, and I think we did another yeah, quick test here. Um, and I'll just keep running through here. Some of these are just quick tests. Um, and again, configuring path names. Um, none of this is super critical to machine learning. It's just some like the setup for making this activity work. Um, the first thing we'll do that's like a real uh, configuration kind of run here. Someone asked about configuring the environment. Um, we are going to pip install a package called pymatgen. Um, this is a uh, Python machine learning or Python uh, materials package um, that gives us a lot of nice functionality for um, like handling uh, materials composition strings, for example, is the main thing we'll do with it. 
Um, this capture tag just like prevents a huge amount of output from uh, going into the notebook, but you should see uh, a check mark there once that's completed. Um, and then we'll dive into um, some of the uh, kind of setup here. There's a lot of text instructions, which is similar things to what I was just talking through. Um, I should close this. Uh, can PyMatGen extract features? Um, that's a great question. I don't, PyMatGen, if I remember right, is not uh, a machine learning package specifically. I don't think they have anything for like feature extraction. They're more interested in helping us like handle material science data. Um, so they are not machine learning focused. They're more of like materials focused. Um, they do have some nice stuff um, for uh, like setting up structures of materials as well, I think as well, um, also. Oh, did I have a bug here? Let me see. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, I think I updated some names and I forgot to pass this on. Uh-oh, so that's my fault. Um, yes, this should be uh, not the July specific. Yeah, I generalized this. So this should be ML for M bootcamp summer 2023. This may be why that uh, this okay so yeah and then you should see this output assuming it exists so i didn't see that output there um, i should have remembered um so yeah you will need to update this line here i apologize i'll after i go back um, after today i'll go back and update this notebook so this gets saved and passed through so later on if you open up it'll have this by default um but for now and i'll copy this in if you're just trying to copy and paste this should be the string so yeah thank you for catching that um, if yeah, you've done something different as well, you could also click here and do this copy path option. So these three ellipses. Um, if your file directory, if you want to configure it differently and then just copy that in to here instead. Um, that should also, I think, set up everything correctly. So thank you for that. Um, and yeah, sorry, I didn't catch that ahead of time when I was scanning back through. Um, so with that set up, again, we should uh, be able to uh, make our way down. I'll do the same thing here where I um, put this here. Um, shouldn't have needed to rerun that, but I'll do it for safety. And then we'll jump down. Um, there's again some introductory text. Um, and then we get to the big like import section where we import everything that we're going to be using. Um, so this is one of the uh, potential things that's a little bit confusing about Python, but it's also one of the like really powerful things about Python is there are all these packages that other people have written that we just get to import and use and will give us a lot of advanced functionality without having to write tons of code. Um, so like pandas gives us uh, functionality for data handling, um, numpy, uh, pymatgen, which is the one we just uh, imported, uh, matplotlib and seaborn are plotting packages, so they'll give us um, plotting uh, ability. Um, scikit-learn is this one here, sklearn gives us all of the machine learning. Um, and no, you shouldn't need to add, yeah, day one, it should just be that top level directory. Um, so yeah, thank you um, for clarifying there. Um, so I'll run through all of these import statements. This should give us, again, access to everything. Um, we also have this custom helper functions um, file. Um, oh, maybe I goofed things up. Um, so if you see this, this is evidence that your path name wasn't set correctly, which means I also didn't set it correctly. Um, so I'm gonna scroll back up and double check here. Um, I have my helper functions. So I'll do the same thing because sometimes there's just issues with I didn't write this exactly right. So let me just do this. Um, so that should be the path name. And let me just run through these one more time. So this is saying that this exists. Okay. And let me jump back down and just see if that is working now. Ooh, hmm, I'm still not seeing that there. Um, let's 
Sorry about this. I apparently, I thought I checked this a second ago and it was working. Um, let me see. Where um, would things be incorrect here? Um, so yeah, I'll do some real time troubleshooting. I apologize. Uh, da, da, da. So we're adding our bootcamp path, which is here. Yeah, I'll try a slightly different. Why don't we just try? Helper functions. I'm not sure. Oops. This, yeah, it's still not going to find it. Um, so, yeah, maybe adding day one was the thing that was missing there. I might have deleted that without remembering when I went back here. So let's try this and just add day one, um, which means it'll look in this folks. That might be the thing that I accidentally deleted. Um, so I'll update that to have day one. And I'll just run through these again. And see success. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for those that suggested day one. Um, I apologize. I'd forgotten how I had set up the path name previously. Um, so let me just copy that into chat again for anyone that is following along. If you have it exactly like this, um, this should uh, work as your path name string. Um, so with that set up, then hopefully you are getting um, down to here. Now everything should be imported. Um, we do have a specific seed set um, for uh, everything that we will be running here. Um, there is uh, you know, a random nature to some of the commands that we are running. There's like a random number generator. Um, so this seed will just fix all of the results. So everything we see will be consistent for everyone. Um, if you want to go see you know, how things change, you're welcome to go change this number uh, later and see you know, what kind of variability you get in the results. Um, but this will at least make things consistent. So we should see exactly the same results as we're going through. Um, there's again, some introduction to uh, the data sets, um, uh, the band gap values, which I'll skip over in the, uh, uh, the things we do here. Um, and now we'll jump into the data inspection section. So we'll look through the data, make sure things are working um, and start to talk through, um, yeah, what the, the data looks like and um, how we're gonna be using it. Um, so here uh, we just read in the band gap data. This is just um, reading from this CSV file. This should be the file that's again in our, um, uh, in our files here. Um, I'll again close out of this for now, just to have more space to look at things. Um, so this is what our data currently looks like when we read it in. Um, so I mentioned we're doing this elemental um, kind of featureization technique. Um, so I set this up ahead of time just to um, uh, make this a little bit quicker to kind of look through. Um, I know there's probably interest in like showing how this works. So if we have time, I'll circle back and like show this exact featureization step. Um, but we can see here, we have a number of columns that are, again, all of these, again, elemental properties, um, and they are all of these composition averages of those. So it's taking all of the uh, chemical compositions that we had in the data, um, averaging across them and giving, you know, what is the average, again, in this case, atomic number for this specific material. Um, if I go to the bottom here, um, just to point out a few you know, aspects of this uh, data set, we have... Um, a fairly small amount of data. So we have 467 data points. Um, as there were some you know, comments in chat, and you know, I mentioned before, this is you know, the whole concept and idea of machine learning is very focused on large data. Um, one of the limitations and, and challenges of material science specifically is oftentimes we are in these situations where we don't have you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of data points. Um, we have you know, hundreds of data points. Um, and so Many of the techniques um, you know, can work for smaller data sets, um, but we definitely can run into some issues, um, which we'll look through and talk about in a second um, when we start getting into these regions. Um, so we have 400-ish uh, data points. We have 92 columns. 
Um, not all of these in this case are features. Um, so if we scroll to the right here, there's a, a scroll bar. Um, we can see um, on the right side um, in this uh, data frame, we have, uh, again, some of this metadata, we have our chemical formula column, um, and then we have the band gap values uh, uh, column itself. Um, so this is the, the target or the labels that we'll try to predict. Um, and then everything left of here is all of these properties. Um, and then we have some metadata that we'll uh, take along with us as well. Um, so this is what this, um, again, tabular data looks like. Um, everything to the left here is all of the features. Um, this column is, is the target um, or the labels. Um, and then the rest of this kind of in the middle here is all the, the metadata. So um, what we do first is we'll just generate some you know, statistics for our data set. We'll kind of understand what are we working with. Um, I mentioned the amount of data points. We have 467. Um, the other thing that's worth maybe pointing out is the average. Um, so our average value is you know 2.2. Um, um, and yeah, when we get so it seems like uh, there's a few people still running into technical issues, which again are my fault for not setting up the path name correctly. Um, on the next break, I'll go pass push through some updates to hopefully get that going um, uh, as we're going through. So yeah, I apologize for that. Um, and yeah, there's a, a good comment. You know, how is that the the difference between what I showed on the slides and what was here? Um, I'll show through one example in a second of exactly how that happened um, to uh, to look through. Um, so when we look through the data, you know, we want to understand how many data points we have um, and kind of what is the distribution of them as well is the other thing to think about. So I pointed out, you know, the average is around 2.2. Um, so this is and the minimum, um, as we uh, mentioned a second ago, is you know close to zero. Um, and the maximum in this case is 13.1. Uh, um, so these are all in electron volts as well. Um, so we can see that you know much of the data is skewed towards the lower end if the max is up here at 13. Um, so that's one thing we'll um, look through um, here in just a second. Um, as you're looking through the, the document here, we also have these sections with kind of exercise questions. Um, for this bootcamp specifically, I'll jump over these. Um, we put these together because we also you know use this example in a lab activity that um, uh, I've taught in the past. So I left them in here because they're kind of useful to think about, especially if you're revisiting this later. Um, and so some of these I'll, I'll call attention to, some of these I might you know, skip over um, as we're just kind of talking through. Um, so one thing we can do to look at the data in more detail is we can just make a histogram of the band gap values. Um, so as I was mentioning a second ago, um, you know, the data is heavily skewed towards one side of the histogram. Um, so this is something I referred to as either having like a balanced or an imbalanced data set. Um, so our data set is pretty heavily imbalanced because again, it's skewed towards the side. Um, this is another one of these things that I wanna call attention to because it's a very common, um, whenever we're looking at you know, real world data, um, we don't have the ideal case that, uh, that a data set is like evenly distributed across the values. Um, so unfortunately that means that um, we, the, the model you know, is learning much more about a certain region of the data as opposed to the other. Um, oftentimes this uh, comes from the like source of the data that we're using. Um, so in this case, there is just much more interest in the uh, scientific community about materials down around zero, one, or two. So that's why it's kind of skewed in that direction. Um, and yeah, it looks like still a few people are having issues there. Um, so maybe I will just take a second and try to push through that change because um, that would probably be worthwhile. Um, so if you're up to date right here, uh, I'll take a quick pause. It should be just a second to hopefully um, push through the updates. And then if you are still running into issues, you should be able to reload in a new um, version of the notebook and that will carry this update with it. Um, so let me just copy this and go back. So this is the one that I'm not editing. Let me just go over and like edit the file directly. So we went in here. Yes, I don't want to go here. This. Okay. So that should be pushed through there. So if you close out of the notebook that you have currently um, and then go back 
Um, and you should see this version that's updated at, at 1241. Um, just now that should pull in that path name update and then everything should work um, without having to make any changes. Uh, so yeah, I apologize for that, but hopefully that will uh, uh, fix those issues for you. And yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so jumping back into what we were, what I was just calling attention to, um, what do we do if we have an imbalanced data set? Um, and this is where we start to get into, into um, potentially some you know, real world uh, trade-offs and decisions that we need to make. Um, so in an ideal world, if we have you know, lots of data, um, we can just like subsample the data set that we have. So we could randomly remove data in this region to balance out the data set. We can just get rid of some of the data in the, in the high region, and that will end us up with a balanced data set. Um, because we're often in these situations where we are heavily data limited, um, that's infeasible. Because if I was to remove you know, half of the data on this end, then I'd be down to like less than 100 data points. And that's like you know, much too small to be doing any like real machine learning with. Um, so uh, on the other side, the, the other trade off or the other thing we could potentially try um, is there are some like super sampling methods where we essentially um, take data we have in the in this region where we are lacking data, and we can kind of artificially duplicate the data points. Um, another thing that can kind of combat this is something called like weighting of data. Um, so you can tell your model to train more heavily towards data where you don't have a, a lot of representation. Um, so those are a few strategies that that sometimes we can use for that. Um, so that'd be like weighting the data or like super sampling of the data. Um, in this case, for this example, we uh, just leave the data set as it is and keep in mind, um, and we just uh, you know acknowledge at the start that you know our data set is quite imbalanced. So when we look at the results later, um, we're just going to kind of accept that there are some regions that the model is not as accurate. Um, so the you know goal behind many of these models is they're looking for these patterns in the data. Um, and they're only looking, or they can only find these patterns where they have access to data. Um, in our case, because we're uh, only interested in really like detailed predictions around like one or two electron volts, um, those are in the existing regions where we have a lot of data. So we're not quite as worried that the model is not as accurate at these higher regions because we don't necessarily care that the model is predicting with an error of like, you know, plus or minus you know, 0 0.01 electron volts up here around eight or nine, because, you know, that's not really the, the region of interest. What we really want is that the model is accurate down uh, again between like one or two. And there's a few other, yeah, quick questions. I think hopefully I addressed kind of the issue of, yeah, why we want balanced data, um, but maybe just say it a slightly different way. We want balanced data because we want the model um, to learn or, we want balanced data if we want the model to learn an even uh, representation of like the whole range that we're interested in. Um, so that would be a reason we want that. Um, and yeah, calling attention, we'll definitely share out a YouTube link uh, for recordings later on. Um, and yeah, a quick question just about the data. What is the index and reliability? Um, yeah, so I mentioned that these are just two examples of, of metadata in this data set. Um, the index is just a, a tracking number um, to have a unique number associated with each data point. So it's just you know, from zero up to um, however many. Um, you can tell there's missing values here, so like zero to six. Um, that means I removed some data from a previous data set as I was cleaning. Um, and that's why there's gaps in these numbers here. But in the original data set I started with, it was just you know, zero, one, two, three, just so there'd be a unique number. So this helps me keep track. In case I want to go back to that older version of the data set, I can tell which uh, points these are and how they match up. Uh, the reliability is um, a number that was generated by the previous uh, scientists that put together this data set. Um, they went through and they assessed all of the experimental methods used to generate the data points, and they gave it a reliability score of uh, between one, two, and three, um, where one was like the most reliable data. Um, so you'll see all the ones that we're using here are values of one, which means these are the like re most reliable data from that data set that we used. So that's just a, a custom column that, that uh, they had put in there just to help people understand um, what the data was. So that's a good question. 
Um, and then another quick question, is this data small? Yes, th this is a region of what we'd consider like sort of a data limited or a small data set to be working with. Um, ideally, um, we'd be working with you know, thousands uh, of data points. Um, if uh, in, yeah, in like an ideal situation. So that's a great, a great question. <clears throat> um, so question here, what if our data is on materials project, then what would the process? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I don't have that as an example here. The uh, short answer to that is that materials project has um, an API um, interface that they have set up where you can um, essentially call and make requests to their database. Um, so that's what I've done in the past. If I've pulled data off a of materials project is um, you can use like their API to, to pull data. Um, so if you just Google like materials project API examples, I, they have some tutorials on the website, um, which you can go uh, look through and hopefully we'll get you started there. Um, so great questions, I'll, I'll keep jumping through. So we looked through, you know, understanding what this data looks like. Um, the other thing, and there was a question that, that I alluded to with this a, a while back um, about kind of big pitfalls. Um, and this is another one that I'll call attention to. I mentioned this, you know, domain of applicability um, in, the, um, in the models that we build. Um, so if you run these three um, code chunks here, what this is doing is just sorting and creating a, a separate table that counts up how many elements there are present in, um, how many elements there are present uh, in the data. Um, so we have 77 um, examples that have oxygen. Um, and then if we look at the other end, you know, we have one example from you know, some other elements. And so just like I said a second ago with looking at the data and how it's distributed across the target variable or the labels, the band gap value, we'd say, okay, we have a lot more data in this region. So we maybe we're more confident the model is gonna predict this region better. Um, the same thing we can say with regards to the elemental representation. So we have a lot of examples of oxides. We have you know, two examples, two examples, one example from a number of other elements. So if we ever wanted to go purely predict you know, a bunch of elements down here, we might be more concerned that the model just hasn't seen these elements before. Um, and then there's going to be others that just aren't in the data set at all. So these would be, again, a common like pitfall or a place to be concerned about if we were trying to make predictions in this region. Um, so these are things to think about um, for you know, how we use the model after we train it. Um, in this next section, we do a little bit of just um, uh, restructuring the existing data set. So we're going to split this into a target data frame and then a features data frame. Um, so this is just doing some manipulation of the columns um, in, um, I don't know if I called attention to it previously, but in this uh, pandas package. So pandas is this data frame or data handling package. Um, so everything we're looking at here is what we refer to as a pandas data frame. Um, so we're just pulling out the target data um, as well as the metadata and putting this into um, a data set by itself. So this is the one I think that I showed in the slides. Um, and then the features data frame is all of these elemental properties. Um, so we'll just keep these separate. Um, this is just a kind of convention that a lot of um, machine learning packages use where they want us to import two separate objects, one with the features and one with the uh, labels in it. Um, so that's just restructuring those. We still see we have you know, 467 rows in each of these. So we haven't you know, removed or modified any of the data. Um, there is, again, some questions in more detail about what do these properties look like? What do these features look like that we generated? Um, so here's the exact formula that was used. Um, you know, we look up each of the property values. We multiply it by the weight um, associated with that. So that's this A or B here. Um, and then we divide by the sum of the weights. So this is just this composition average definition. Um, and we can do a quick check just to show what that looks like. Um, so here's one example chemical formula. Um, we can look up, you could do this, you know, externally, if you wanted to, you know, look up on a, a outside website. So we could um, go to a periodic table here and, you know, pull out these values. Um, as we can see, you know, many of these, again, are included in these standard databases. So if I look at, you know, tantalum, here's a number of uh, properties. Um, I'm not suggesting, you know, in a, in a 
actual research study, you'd go do this by hand, but I'm just kind of showing one time as an example. Um, here's the types of properties that are commonly pulled out here. Um, and if you go through, you can see many of these are represented in our feature set. Um, so we can pull those out. We can say, you know, here's the atomic number um, for two of the elements. Um, we can add in the weights for them. Um, so one and three, this is just from the formula here. So um, one and three, um, and then we can just process them through this formula here. So the composition average should be 60.5. And then if we look specifically at the data frame here, so we look at this atomic number composition average um, and pull out the specific index for 62, which was the one that we set at the beginning here. Um, so this pulls out exactly what's in the data frame and we see that these match up. So really great question in chat. Um, how do you choose which features uh, or properties to use? Um, and yeah, we'll talk about correlation in a second. So I'll skip over that aspect of it. Um, so yeah, we'll talk through correlation, but how do we choose the um, things that I usually think about when I'm trying to decide on features to use? Um, one thing to, that is really useful is to think about accessibility of the features. Um, so one of the motivations behind using this feature set specifically and, and all these elemental properties is that these are essentially instantaneously available. You know, they're in databases, um, we can look them up, you know, PyMatGen has a number of them included there that we can look up. Um, there are some other uh, packages um, that we can just do like one or two line calls to that will give us this huge list of properties. And so um, when we have accessible features like that, that's really beneficial if we want to be making rapid predictions with our model. Because um, if, we, if we step past, you know, the training step and, and you know, making our model, if we think of the end use case, what we want to be able to do is to generate that feature set, which we use as an input to the model um, as quickly as possible so that we can make predictions quickly. If one of our features requires, you know, a six month experiment to generate, if like you're doing some nuclear, if you're working with like nuclear data and it's like, well, you know, this feature is an irradiation that takes, you know, six months, then all of your predictions are held back by that feature. It needs, you know, six months to generate that number that you feed as the input to the model. Um, so if that's the case, then, then even though the model might, might run really quickly, the feature set might hold it back. Um, so accessibility is really important. Um, so that's one thing I'd think about. Um, the other thing to think about, and this is tied into your, your comment on correlation, is um, what types of information is being included. Um, so one thing specifically we have not included with all of these elemental properties is we have nothing about the structure of the materials. Um, so someone uh, asked earlier about, you know, how do we tell the difference between aluminum 30, copper 70 and aluminum 70, copper 30? And we do that by having the composition average. But another similar question to ask is, how do we tell the difference? How does this feature set tell the difference between liquid, uh, uh, liquid materials and solid materials? And the answer is that it doesn't. Um, so that's a big limitation behind the, the methods that we're showing here. So if we wanted to be able to predict for these two different phases, or even you know, more nuanced, different structures within the same composition, um, we need to add more information or new types of features. We would need structural information included somehow in the feature set, um, which this current one you know, does not. Um, so that's another thing to, to you know, add to our list of current limitations behind you know, this specific implementation. Um, whenever we go make predictions, we need to be um, thinking back to how we set up the features and how they determine the types of predictions that are um, reasonable to make with the model. So that's a, a really uh, great question and, and something to be uh, thinking about. Um, and oftentimes, you know, there's trade-offs there where, you know, a certain feature set maybe gives you more limited information, but is easily accessible. Then there's like an intermediate feature set that needs maybe some computations or some experiments to generate, but it gives you more detailed information about the material. Um, so there's like trade-offs about, you know, how much information do you want to include um, and how intensive uh, is the time needed to get that information. So, yeah, great, great question. Um, and for the uh, correlation, we'll again talk about that in just a second in more detail. Um, so that's our example of setting up the features, looking through the data. Um, we'll now jump into yeah, the section three um, on feature engineering. Um, this, again, is a term that may be interchangeable with featureization is another common way people will say this. Um, and just like uh, you know, Brandon had just mentioned, 
Um, we will look through um, looking at correlation and features. Um, the other steps we'll point out is, oops, looking at um, tied into that, looking at you know, constant features. Um, and then the last thing, which is I think the most important in some sense is looking at normalization of features. Um, so there's a great question here. Uh, bah, bah, bah. How heavily do you consider the method by which the features were gathered? If you're using training data from different databases, they might use different methods, absolutely, or theoretical methods for sure, um, to calculate their values. Is it a good practice to only use data from one database? So there's consistency. Yeah, great question. Um, so I'll pull out two, two versions of this. So <clears throat> if the, that, I'm gonna scroll back up here to where we have both our data sets. Um, so I think I have two separate answers. For the target data, yes, we wanna be very careful about where our data is coming from. Um, so that was one of the reasons um, I, I skipped over this in like the data cleaning section uh, for this bootcamp, but um, there was this whole reliability step where I was filtering out other types of data because they came from experiments that had more error associated with them. Um, and so, yeah, we purposely removed those because we wanted to be careful about that. Um, and definitely if we're doing things where we have, yeah, a, a theoretical, like a DFT calculation um, of a property like the band gap, um, depending on, on um, everyone's background, there is very like known errors associated with band gap values from DFT. Like you, you can do a, a, a quick, a quote unquote, quick DFT calculation of band gap, and it will probably have a lot of error associated with it. Um, and then there are like much more intensive ways to get hopefully more accurate band gaps. Um, all of these specifically, you know, were experimental values. If we combined these together, um, we would need to be very careful about how we did so. Um, specifically, if we know there's like known, you know, errors in some of the methods. Um, it's not, that's not to say it's like impossible or like irresponsible to do so, um, but we definitely want to be aware of the errors that we are adding in um, especially if they um, have like known biases to them and stuff like that. Um, or if there, there's potentially like, um, what's the, what am I trying to say? Um, if, if the data that you're adding in, if you have like a, a very accurate method and then a more inaccurate method, if you're adding in say like 5% more data to your database, but that new data is all um, has much bigger error bars on it, then potentially you're just adding a lot of noise into your database. And so like any patterns that you're looking for, trying to, to go back to this analogy, if you're looking for you know, these patterns and there's just a bunch of new noise in the database, potentially that's gonna obscure the pattern. So it could you know, actually degrade the performance by adding more data to the database. Um, so sometimes there's trade-offs. Um, one of the strategies I've used in the past is um, oftentimes different experimental methods produce different ranges. Um, so like for band gap, we might think, um, trying to, to stay in this example, you know, there might be one technique that is really good for semiconductors. And then there might be one technique that's like really good for high band gap materials. So if we had these two different experimental techniques, but they were in completely different ranges, that might be, um, we might have less worry about combining those together because there's no like overlap in the values that are added. So you're, you're purely like introducing a new range of data which is generally like you know useful and can expand the generalizability of the data uh, data set. So yeah, there's a lot that goes into that. That's a really good thing to be thinking about. And um, the other half, which I'll go through maybe quickly on that, is for the features. I think I would be potentially less. Well, let me actually be more careful about that. I think I'd say that you, probably the same thing about the features. Um, if you had different methods for generating them, um, but sometimes, or I'd say I'd be more willing to say that it would be okay to add in like two methods for generating a similar feature. I wouldn't combine them together, but you might have two features that are like analogous, but just from different methods. So this doesn't make sense quite for like atomic number, but say we had, you know, atomic number from experiment A and atomic number from experiment B, um, we could put those in, you know, potentially together. Um, and what we might hope that the, the machine learning model would learn is that, you know, uh, how to combine those different experimental values as features um, to get the most reliable result. Um, so that's something I could definitely see being useful. Um, again, as long as we weren't just adding in like a bunch of noise uh, from like a very like erroneous uh, method. 
but certainly um, that's something that we could do as well. Um, so yeah, great, great question. Um, and I think, yep, yeah, I think I got all those. Um, so yeah, scroll down, we were in feature engineering. Um, so here, again, we're just going through these three steps here. Um, the, I'm gonna go through and run the code here quickly. Um, and then I'll just talk through, I think I'll mainly talk through the correlation and the normalization. Um, so I'm gonna go through this quickly. This is just, um, again, going through these steps here. And so I'm gonna go down until I get to the visual, visualization section, which I think is the easiest way to kind of talk through it. So what these sections are doing, I'll stop here, is they're generating these two um, correlation matrices. Um, so this is just looking at the number of each of the features. It's just assigning a number um, to each feature and then looking at how correlated each feature is with other features in the data set. Um, so you can make this big long matrix. Um, the darkness and the, the numbers close to one here is saying these are highly correlated features, meaning they have very similar information in them. Um, so you can see this diagonal line here, this is telling us you know, each feature is perfectly correlated with itself. Um, and so <clears throat> one thing that uh, is common to do is to try to simplify our models as much as possible um, while maintaining their accuracy. And so reducing the number of features is one way that we do that. Um, if we were in you know, a, a, a blank space and we said we have one model that has five features and has a certain accuracy and another model that has you know, 500 features and has the same accuracy, we would prefer the model with five features because it is more interpretable. We, it's more easy to understand like how those five features are interacting together um, to give the predictions. Um, so with that spirit, oftentimes we're trying to you know, reduce number of features, simplify things down as much as we can. Um, so this is one of these steps um, that is fairly common. And the idea again is that if the features are highly correlated with each other, then they're giving similar information to the model. And if they're giving similar information, that means the model probably doesn't need both of those features to make the same prediction. Um, so if we remove one, we probably won't lose a huge amount of performance. So that's what's done here. This is comparing the left and the right. Um, we started with 87, I think, features, and then we dropped down to 71 or so. Um, this is one of these stages um, so far, I haven't really called attention to, but one of these stages where you can go back and um, make some edits if you want. And I'd encourage you if you want to try to you know, change some things up. Um, this is a, a pretty simple edit to make. Um, in here, we are setting this uh, cutoff here as 95%, 0 0.95 um, in this correlation metric. Um, and so if you change this value, this will change how many features are kept. So um, if we reduce the value, so if I do something you know pretty extreme here, um, then uh, and reduce this down to like 0 0.4, we should be able to do the same thing. Um, and I'm actually gonna jump back to the top to make sure this still will work. Um, so we can see what happens. So if I do this, I could reduce this down to a model with only eight features um, by changing that value. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to play around with this, this value, see you know, what happens when we train a model when we get to that in a second with less features in it. Um, can I explain the line starting with upper? Yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, I, I, I skipped through just in kind of the interest of time, but I'm happy to uh, circle back if there's specific interest. Um, the line with upper, let's see. Ah, here. Um, so yeah, I pulled this, I think I put it up in the text above. So I pulled this just for an example. Um, so this is just an implementation um, of the um, uh, the I'm totally blanking on the name. Um, this uh, Pearson correlation metric. There it is. It's in the code. Um, this Pearson correlation metric. Um, so what this is doing is um, just restructuring things. Um, it's a pretty complex, and I'm forgetting the details of it. But this is this MP here. Every time we're calling MP, this is um, uh, NumPy. Is it's kind of popping up here. Um, so we're basically taking the existing um, data frame. We are just like restructuring it. Um, this like ones um, and then try u. This is like triangular upper. So this is like restructuring the matrix. Um, 
so that it is compatible with how this specific uh, like correlation wants things structured. Um, I know that's not a really good answer. Um, and partly it's because I'm forgetting the details of exactly how that is set up. Uh, but the, the idea is this is purely just restructuring the existing data frame. It is taking this uh, features correlation data frame, which is defined you know, up here. Um, and it is just restructuring what is existing in there. Um, or no, I'm misremembering. I think this is just restructuring for the plotting, if I remember it. Because we already do the correlation here. Yeah, so this is just restructuring it for the plotting. I think. This is just to, the, the like triangular thing is taking, yeah, okay, I remember. It's taking the matrix and then it's, yeah, doing this like upper triangularization, which just means like take this section of the matrix um, and then it's doing uh, a mirror about that so that we get this plot. So it's really just like to configure the plot. Um, it's kind of what's going on there, I think, um, when we're looking at these. So I don't think there's anything particularly interesting to kind of dig into, or at least from my perspective, that's like all uh, kind of details that are in some sense kind of irrelevant to everything overall. Um, so I'll switch this back to 0 0.95, just so I'm using the default. Um, and I'm going to go run back from the top of this section just to make sure I'm not accidentally passing on something incorrect. So um, I should have 71 features, which is the, the default that I had set up as. Uh, so uh, there's a few questions that I missed a second ago. Can we use... Um, yeah, so you could definitely use other yeah feature importance methods. There, there are um, plenty of other ways you could um, kind of define things here if you're trying to reduce features. So yeah, PCA is a common one. That's principal component analysis. Um, using random forest feature importance is a very common one as well. Um, I'll point out when we get to that in a second where you could like pull that score out of. So absolutely, I think those are those are all fairly interchangeable and kind of worth trying out uh, in different ways. Um, will the accuracy of the model be reduced um, if you have you know highly correlated features? Some models more than others, yes. That can it can be um, kind of detrimental to the model's performance. Um, for the tree-based models that we're using today, not so much um, from my experience, but it is I think always kind of a concern and like a best practice to do something like that. Um, oh yeah, so great question. How does it decide which of the two features? Um, I think in this case, we just choose the one with like the lower feature number um, to keep. Um, but I don't know. The idea is that you're removing a like functionally identical feature. So it shouldn't matter which one you remove. Um, but you could do a test where you yeah, used one or the other and see if that actually holds true. But the idea is that it shouldn't be sensitive to which one you remove. Um, is correlation with the tar uh, feature with target or predictive property important? So yes. So in that case, we we want correlation with the uh, predicted uh, with the target. Um, so the the whole idea with these features is that, uh, or the whole idea with having features and using them as inputs for our models is they should contain some information about the target. Um, so we hope that they are some in some way correlated. Um, in this case, the, the like Pearson correlation is just looking at like linear correlation. Um, so some features aren't going to be like linearly cor correlated with the target, but they should you know, have some information about the target. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, a few other questions. If one feature is a function of another, will it remove one of them? How decide which one to remove? Um, so yeah, so it, I think, depends what that function is. Um, so with this specific implementation, um, again, if you want to uh, kind of look up the details, this is just using this you know, Pearson correlation um, score, which is, I think, purely looking at linear relationships. Um, so if you have that x2 is a function of x1, if, if that function is highly nonlinear, then this won't be similar at all based on the Pearson correlation score. And so it would keep both of those. But if the function was just purely a linear relationship, then yes, they would show up as like identical. Um, and then 
one type of group move um, if, if you were just using this specific method. Um, and then, yeah, what, what is a feature? So that's a great question. So yeah, I introduced this term and maybe I um, didn't do a good job. Um, so a feature is a, uh, another name to just say an input to the model. Um, so a feature is uh, any information that we're feeding in as inputs um, with the types of models and the, the way that we're running them here, um, you can just think of this as a number. It is some sort of number that we're using as an input. So if I scroll back up um, here, so you'll see, you know, all of these um, are just, you know, some kind of number. Um, or sorry, this is the correlation. So that's not the values themselves, but in a similar way, when I go back up here, um, so all the atomic number composition averages, you know, this, these are just, you know, uh, it's just a big long vector essentially. Um, so that's what we mean by a feature. And how are there 71 of them? Yeah, so that's that's um, a good question. So there are, there are 71 of them because there are different elemental properties that we are trying to use because you know, we've decided that they have interesting information that might be related to the band gap. Um, so there's 71 of them because that's how many we had access to. Um, uh, after we you know, removed some of the correlated ones, there's 87 here specifically. Um, there, um, yeah, I think that is the that is the answer to that question. Um, so I'll jump back down. Let's see where I left off. Um, so yeah, we did this section. We uh, looked through here, and then we did the first part of feature engineering. So I'll scroll back down to where we stopped here. So we uh, got down to seventy one features, um, and then the last chunk of the feature engineering. Um, to point out um, is feature normalization. Um, so something you may have noticed, and I'll, I'll call attention to here more specifically, is that all of these elemental properties are extremely different from each other. Um, they have different magnitudes, they have different ranges. Um, and because of this, some models can be very sensitive to the values themselves. Um, so to, just to be more explicit about what I mean here, so the atomic radii, um, average here, you know, is always going to be, um, you know, around one to um, somewhere in that range. Whereas the atomic volume um, or these other values, you know, this one is, you know, 9,000 down to 23. So the dynamic range here is, you know, an order of magnitude bigger um, or two orders of magnitude bigger. Um, the values themselves are bigger. Um, and so what this means is that some models can get fooled during the training process by just thinking like this feature changes a lot, so it must be important. Um, and that's something that um, can happen just based on like the mathematics going on on the back end. Um, so feature normalization is a strategy to combat that. And the whole idea behind feature normalization is that we will take the values of the features and we'll squish them down so that they all look similar to each other. Um, it does not remove information or destroy information of the features, it just shifts that information so that it's all kind of on the same playing field. Um, so I'll show that in a second. The specific method that we do in this case is this min-max scalar. Um, so this one explicitly sets, if I you know, open up and we can actually see the you know, quick documentation here. Um, if you do, for any of these like methods that we're importing, if you mouse over and then click once or twice, it'll, it should pop up. Um, so this one is purely taking the features and then rescaling them so that the minimum and the maximum are the same for all the features. Um, so it's just a linear transformation. Um, so we you know, call that, we do this fit transform function and we feed in our data frame that we started with. So this is the one that we just modified up above. Um, and then we print that out to see what that looks like. Um, so now we have all of our properties, but now they all range between zero and one. So now the model won't get kind of fooled by thinking like, oh, here's this really big number. I think that's really important. Now it will actually look at the relationships more evenly between the features. Um, so exactly, it is it is normalization, um, exactly. Um, and there's another yeah, question about that like modification. What if there's a third feature that depends on another two, say like X3 is X2 plus X1? Um, I think that would, yeah, that would just depend on what those features were. So yeah, if if X3 is like a linear combination of X2 and X1, then it's probably 
fairly, or it is likely that X3 is gonna be linearly correlated by that Pearson correlation matrix or by that Pearson correlation value uh, from X3 to X1 and X3 to X2. So it might, you know, choose to remove those. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, uh, good question. Why not use standard scaling? So this is one example and one choice that we can make. Um, in this case, we chose min-max scalar because um, one, it's kind of simple to explain. Um, and the second underlying reason is that the random forests and the decision trees that we build here are actually not very sensitive to this um, at all um, because of how they uh, work. So um, we chose this one just uh, as an example to show it in action. Um, other models are very, very, very sensitive to the specific method used. Um, so there's this model called Lasso, for example, that um, actually breaks when we use this min-max scaler. So this is a, a method or a, a choice that is very tied into certain model types. Um, and so this one that's really is um, kind of important if you're using a new model type you're not familiar with to look at different feature um, normalization uh, techniques um, to see which one performs best and, and is mo the most reliable. So yeah, so there's not really a strong reason to use min-max scalar in this case over, for example, standard scalar. <clears throat> and I'm looking at the time and we went a little longer than I was intending, um, or I got lost track of time. Um, I was trying to have two breaks before the end. So we have about 45 minutes left, a little less. Why don't we take a quick like five minute break just to let people stand up and stretch. Um, and then we'll reconvene here for the last uh, you know, 40 minutes or so. Um, so I'll stop since we're at uh, kind of the end of the feature uh, engineering section. We'll start to talk through model evaluation um, and kind of wrap things up with that section. Uh, so I'll leave things here and start another quick break timer. Um, so let's do five minutes and then we'll jump back in for the last chunk of time. Right, where's my timer? Uh, there we go. All right.
All righty, welcome back, y'all. Hopefully people are getting back from a uh, break. We'll jump back in here in just a second. <clears throat> um, let me just make sure I have stuff here. All righty. Um, so yeah, we've been talking about um, you know, featureization. Um, again, thank you everyone for the question. That's always you know, super helpful to um, be able to you know, know where people are at, help you know, uh, work through any confusion, stuff like that. Um, for the last section here that we're gonna talk through today, um, for the last yeah, 35 minutes or so, um, is talking about model evaluation, model assessment, um, so everything that we've gone through so far is setting up, you know, here's how we pre-configure everything before we actually train a machine learning model. Um, and as we jump into this, the first thing that we uh, will do here is establish this train test split. Um, and I'll go through and I'll uh, kind of run through this section really quick um, and then show what we uh, mean by this, you know, training data and testing data. Um, these are two terms that are you know, very common. Um, and um, we'll show through this. Um, actually, I forgot about this little chunk of code. Um, so we added in this additional thing um, here. This isn't super important. This is like a specific uh, section where we pulled out a few specific uh, compositions. Um, for again, this lab that this was based off of. Um, so you don't have to worry about the specific code here. Um, sorry, this was the section I was remembering where we're uh, setting up the train test split. Um, so the, the you know, terms to define here are training data and testing data. Um, so training data is the data that we'll, we will actually feed to the model um, to uh, you know, train the machine learning model. Um, and then testing data is the data that we will evaluate, you know, how that training went. Um, the reason that we need to set up training and testing data um, is because um, on the whole, these models are so um, advanced and sophisticated um, that if we just give the model uh, access to data, it will fit very closely to that data. Um, it will fit so closely to that data that it will do something that we refer to as overfitting, um, meaning that the um, model essentially just reproduces exactly the training data without actually uh, then extrapolating well to new data. Um, and I'll show that here in just a second when we look at some of the results, um, where I think it'll become a little more clear what I'm talking about. Um, but essentially what we're doing mechanically here is we're just randomly splitting the data into two groups. Um, so we have X train, X test, and then we have Y train, Y test. Um, so this is uh, what we did before that I, I skipped over a second ago is we just took the previous data frames that we had and we called one X, which is our features, our inputs, and one Y, which is our targets or our labels. Um, so with uh, that set up, um, I'll run through this next section here and we can look, um, we get a bunch of warnings, unfortunately, because this code's a little bit old. Um, but if you scroll down past those uh, deprecation warnings, you can see um, we have a quick, again, visualization of what this data looks like. Um, so we have the training data, we have the test data. Um, and the one thing I'll call back to is we, we mentioned at the beginning that you know we're fairly data limited. Um, so what this means is that um, in our test data set, this is again, only 10% of the data. Um, or I don't know if I mentioned, I think I skipped over that, uh, the exact definition, but you know, we defined the test data set as 10% here. Um, so this is only 10% of the data. So it's only 40, what, 46, 47 data points. Um, and so um, there's some values that will be missing. There are some differences between the full data set, which is this outline here, and then the actual test values. Um, so again, this is kind of a limitation of the fact that we're working with a fairly small data set um, and just something to, to keep in mind again as, as we're assessing. Um, but with the, the test and the train data uh, defined, we can then go and actually you know, run the line of code that trains the model. Um, so if I skip over the, the text here um, and go back, this is actually the one that I think I ran at the beginning. Um, this line of code is the, the training line. So um, something that's, that's worth pointing out is 
you know, there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of times, you know, custom code that you have to write to uh, manipulate data, to do the data cleaning, um, all that stuff. When we actually get to training models, um, this is one thing that's really kind of nice is that oftentimes it's just a single line of code to like define and then train the model. This fit function is the only thing that is really doing the training. Um, so we're feeding in, you know, the X train, the Y train, and we're just telling it, you know, fits to this model that we've defined. Um, for those of you that have used scikit-learn before, there's some slightly weird things that we're doing here, which I'll um, explain in a second. Um, so we're defining this random forest uh, regressor object. This is the machine learning model from scikit-learn. Um, again, if I mouse over, it'll you know, pop up with some of the um, documentation from scikit-learn here. Um, so we're not, uh, you know, setting a lot of these um, uh, hyperparameters of the model, um, but we're setting a few of them. Um, one that we're doing uh, is this n estimators. So we're setting the number of trees in this random forest to one. Um, so this is essentially to mimic a single decision tree. Um, and then we're turning off the bootstrapping in this case, which is this um, certain setting that uh, these random forest models can use. Um, if there's interest, I'll, I'll circle back and maybe explain in detail what this is. But um, the key idea here is we're just defining and then or we're mirroring and defining a simple uh, single decision tree uh, model. And we're asking it to fit to all of the data here. Um, and yeah, a few questions in chat that I'll, that I'll jump through really quick. Um, if we use shuffle true when dividing, do you think they will shuffle features and targets uniformly or could it mess up the features and target values? Um, I'm forgetting the exact convention behind how they set up the shuffle. Um, let me scroll back up and just see if that jumps back into my mind real quick. Um, I think if I remember right, the shuffle, all that that's doing is well, let me let me check the question you asked really quick. Uh, it will not shuffle between the X and Y data. So you have the X and Y are two separate objects. So it won't like shuffle the X and Y. Um, I believe if I remember right, that the shuffling is um, just making sure that uh, everything is like randomized correctly. Um, I could be misremembering that that specific setting. Um, and maybe I'll go I'll go dig in uh, at the end to try to look through the documentation and remind myself exactly what that is changing. Um, but if I remember right, that's just like making sure that like the randomization is initialized correctly. Um, so I'll scroll back down here to where we're training the model. Um, so model training is complete. Um, and then the next chunk of code, I believe, um, oh yeah, we're using some of those ones that we pulled out. Um, again, I'll skip over the details there. We I think we talked through in the text a little bit about kind of looking at those. Um, so instead, I'll skip down to the plotting section and we'll look through a few of these um, parity plots, which are similar to that one that we looked at in the slides. Um, there's a few other questions, which I'll jump through uh, for a second. Why are, the, why are there missing values in the predictions for the test set? Um, so those missing values, um, they're missing because they're in the training set. Um, so again, the, the thing I was trying to point out there is that we are you know, very data limited. So for some of those values for like a band gap of, of five or six, for example, we only had you know, two or three data points in that range. And so just due to the random nature of the splitting between the train and the test set, um, you know, maybe all of the values in that range got set to the training set instead of the test set. So that's why some of those bars were missing. Um, when I'm establishing the train set test sets, you are seeing seed not defined. Um, seed was set way at the top of the notebook, so you probably skipped over that code section. Um, you can just reset a seed right there if you want to. So if you, uh, for example, if that's if that's missing, you could go here and just do code. You know, uh, you're basically just defining a, a variable here. So seed equals, and you can put in any number. Um, if you want to have the exact results we're looking at, you'll want to go run the seed at the top of the code, but you could also just redefine a new seed here. So something like that would be perfect. Seed equals any number you want. Um, and that will just make it exist. Um, that's also something you can try if you want to see you know, different results. Um, so um, awesome. It looks like yeah, someone else caught that as well. So thanks all for help troubleshooting for those of you that are, that are following along. Um, so here's our first set of results. 
Um, I mentioned this term overfitting. Um, and this is one of these results or plots we might look at to decide if our model is overfitting to the training set. Um, so because of how I set up the model, I kind of did this on purpose just to demonstrate this. Um, I set up the model so that it would overfit to the training set. And that is evidenced by the fact that all of these points are exactly on the dotted line here. Um, so again, the, the dotted line is our line of, of perfect predictions. Um, so our predicted band gap is exactly the same as the measured band gap. Um, and initially you might think like, oh, that's great. You know, they're, they're perfect. Um, but keep in mind, this is the data that the model has seen before. You know, this is the model, this is the data the model trained on. Um, and so when we look at the other data set, the test data set, this is data that the model did not train on. And now we just asked it to predict that. Um, and here's the results that we see here. So now we see these incredibly large errors for many of the data points where the, the points are very far from the dashed line. And this discrepancy between training data and testing data is one of these key indicators that this model is overfit to the training data. Um, it's like fooling itself by thinking it's, it's, very, it's performing very well, but it does not extrapolate to data that it hasn't seen before. Um, so that's one of the, the purposes of the test data is to kind of mimic the real world and assess the model on data that it, it you know, it, it has not seen, it has not been trained on um, previously. Um, and this is one of, if there's, you know, one key takeaway to kind of focus on for model assessment, this idea of training and test data and kind of identifying overfitting is one of these really like um, key things to understand. Um, we can also, um, so from the parity plots, we can look you know, qualitatively at the model performance. I'm pointing out, you know, look at these individual large errors. We can also quantitatively uh, assess this as well. Um, so based on these plots, there's a whole range of quantitative um, metrics that we can generate. Um, we put a few of them in the table at the bottom here. Um, in the interest of this boot camp, I'm not going to go through like defining all of these. Um, but just know that, you know, there are ways to get a number associated with this. Um, and oftentimes it's these numbers that we'll like call attention to in the, in like, you know, papers or hear people report. They'll say, you know, my model had a, a an MAE value of, of this, for example. Um, so this is a way that we can numerically compare models and decide which one is performing better or uh, worse. Um, uh, instead of just like looking, you know, qualitatively at the parity plots. Um, and yeah, could could someone or can someone use other regressors to get the to see the best model? Yes, that is something I, I'd highly encourage you um, if you're trying to you know, improve your understanding. Um, and it should be a very simple change. So on this line here, um, where we you know define and train our model, you can basically you know swap this in with any other model. Well, maybe not any other model, but a lot of other models on Scikit-Learn, and it will just work out of the box. So I'll try to maybe show one of those just to to give us an idea. I think I put a link somewhere in the text here, um, but I'll just go look, I'll just go grab it myself. Um, so if we go back to that page that scikit-learn, you know, supervised models, um, if we go to this supervised learning page, um, any of these um, should work. Um, and so I'll grab, let's see, something that is fairly simple just to kind of show off. Um, I'll grab ridge regression. So when you go into scikit-learn here, um, if you're looking for how to like substitute this in, you might have to follow a few links like this, but you're looking for this documentation page where it gives you kind of this line at the top. Um, so this class um, or this uh, ridge is what we're looking for here. So this is like the name of the model. Um, so if I wanted to put this in here, um, what I can do is I can comment this out and maybe I'll also just grab this line really quick, just so I have that. Um, so if I wanted to make a ridge model, um, the name is just ridge, just like that. Um, I'll probably also have to import it because um, we probably didn't import all of those model types at the beginning. So I'm also gonna scroll way back to the top where we did all of those import statements. Um, so I'm grabbing that here. Um, so here's where we imported, you know, from scikit-learn.ensemble, import random force regressor. So if you're, if you're um, kind of doing this for the first time, it's nice to kind of copy and paste and edit things. Um, so I'll just copy and paste this down here um, just to have this in the same place that we're looking at it. Uh, so here's our model. And I'll add a new 
line of code here. Um, and so instead, what we're looking for is you know, from scikit-learn period linear model import ridge. Um, so that's the edit I'm going to make here. So I'm going to say from scikit-learn. So this isn't under the ensemble package. This is under linear models import ridge. So that should give me access to the ridge regression model that's defined here. Um, and then I want to look through and see like what are the settings that I want to define here. Um, in this case, defaults usually at least will run and give us something. Um, so I'm not going to define anything um, and see what happens. So, oh, is this not the right section? Let's see. Where did I make those edits? Oh, here. Um, oh, I went to the, I see. This was the one that I wanted to, to edit. Um, so we, yeah, we do those that other training run. So I'm gonna copy this one instead, which is just using a slightly different version of the data set. So I'll comment this out. I'll change this to Ridge. And then we'll still feed in the random state. And let's just check that that has an input. Yep, random state here, so that should work. Um, this doesn't apply. Um, so N estimators and bootstrap are these specific settings for the random forest. I'll leave the others as defaults and just not define them. And so let's try to train that model. So model training complete, and we'll see what it looks like. Um, I'll skip over again this section because uh, this was this other random test we were doing. And so let's plot this new you know, default model. So here's what the ridge model looks like out of the box. Um, so compared to um, the that single decision tree, um, the training data, you know, looks much worse. But interestingly, the test data looks similar. Um, uh, so I didn't pull out the exact numbers um, to compare for the random forest data. Um, but the test data actually is, I think, a little bit higher. I think the other one was like 0 0.6 something um, for this MAE metric. Um, but uh, qualitatively looks kind of similar to the random forest. But that's kind of the, the step. Um, that you would do if you're trying to substitute out for another model. Um, and I'll scroll back out up and I'll jump back to the random forest. Or in this case, it's not really a random forest, it's just a single decision tree. Um, I'll go back up there just because that's the, the default settings we had. So this is the, um, the initial results that we got. <clears throat> Um, and then, yeah, for, um, so there's a question about kind of YouTube uh, channels and follow-ups. I'll send that out all out via email and that'll all be linked through the, um, this like Google Drive folder as well, um, in case you're looking for that later. Um, and let's see, in the interest, of, I see a few other questions that I'm gonna skip over for now and I'll circle back to if I have time at the end, but I wanna at least get through the um, initial key points here. Um, the, again, one thing I was hoping uh, really to, to focus on is this idea of overfitting and looking at you know, training data results versus testing data results. Um, so this idea of overfitting, also this idea that you know, we cannot trust any plots or error metrics we make on training data. This is not an accurate representation of how the model will perform on new data that is not seen. So like in the real world um, or for the test data specifically. Um, so that's why there's this real importance of separating out training data and testing data. Um, so what we do next is we go through, um, I'm just going down to the next uh, kind of code sections. Um, and what I'll show quickly is <clears throat> what this model actually looks like. So we said, you know, this model is um, uh, you know, overfit to the data. Um, so there's this visualization chunk of code we can run. If I scroll over, I can find, um, you can see this model you know, is, is pretty big. If I zoom out you know, quite a bit, we can uh, get an idea for what's going on here. Um, so this is what our decision tree looks like. Um, so we see you know, all these boxes. Um, each of these has a single, let's scroll back in just so we can maybe read a few. Um, each of these boxes has a single feature associated with it. Um, so this is this uh, radius value. Um, this is like number of unfilled electrons uh, or electron, uh, or uh, pretty exactly what this is. Number of unfilled, 
something, I'm not sure, something about the electrons. Um, but anyway, each of these has, you know, a single feature um, and the feature has, you know, a greater than or less than sign. It's a simple, you know, splitting um, metric based on the value of an individual feature. Um, so that is the, the structure of these tree-based models is they are just splitting. Um, every time that a data point kind of falls into one of these boxes, it asks this question. It says, you know, for this data point, is this feature greater than or less than a value? And then if it's greater than the value, it goes in one direction. And if it's less than the value, it goes in another direction. So we can kind of see it. Um, I'll scroll down to kind of the bottom of the tree to, to show as well. Um, so let's find one that's maybe easier to understand. So these like ionization energies. You know, is ionization energy greater than 0 0.3? If yes, go here. If no, go here. Um, and so when we get to the bottom of the tree, like we are here, where there's no further boxes below it, um, that it's connected to, then this is where the prediction is made. So this value here is the prediction that happens at each of these boxes. Um, and so the other thing that's being reported for each of the boxes for these like samples, this is showing how many data points in the training data set um, uh, are, are housed in each of these boxes. And what you'll see is that for all the leaf nodes, the samples are one. Um, so that means each leaf node, each, each last box here, is a single data point. Um, and it makes a prediction that is has an error of zero. So squared error is like the error term for each one. And so this matches up with the, the visual that we saw a second ago, where all of the error is zero here. Every single point is perfectly predicted, um, which in this case, again, is a bad thing. This is like the, the, the quintessential you know, overfitting problem. Um, the model is so complex that it is simply just reproducing um, all of the training data perfectly, and then it's not extrapolating to the test data. So, um, so that's a, the way to visualize that. If you, because this output is so big, you can click here on the left and this will get rid of it. This just makes it easier to kind of move around in the notebook. Um, if you want to regenerate that, you can rerun the code there. Um, so um, we're close to the end here. We have one last section, which I'll expand out. Um, and that's talking through um, a slightly more advanced way to look through this assessment. Um, so instead of just doing a single train and test split, um, we can do something called cross-validation, or in this case, um, a specific implementation of cross-validation called k-fold cross-validation. Um, and what this does is it basically makes a bunch of different temporary train and test splits in your data set. So instead of just getting a single error metric, um, you can get a uh, kind of statistical representation of um, not only the error metric, but also like a standard deviation of that error metric. Um, so that can be really useful for understanding um, as a whole um, how the model is performing um, across many different splits. Um, and also the other thing that's really nice um, about doing uh, cross-validation is that um, uh, uh, something that's tied into this method is that instead of having this test data that is like you know, permanently left out, um, you can include all of the data as kind of temporary training data during this cross-validation process. Um, so that's really nice, especially if we're in these, again, low data regimes where the fact that we left out 10% of our data as test data um, means that we had 10% you know, less data to train on. So um, it can be especially useful, again, for these like low data um, situations. Um, so in this section, we show how um, to define that and looking through what those results look like. Um, the other thing that we um, do here um, that's kind of happening in this line of code here is we're doing um, a uh, a, a grid search of these values. So or sorry, a grid search potentially of different uh, values in the uh, model itself. Um, so the way that we set this up is that there's this dictionary of um, this n estimators term. This is the number of trees in the, the model. Um, so it's set to one right now just by default because we were just reproducing this. Um, but what we can do is if we wanted to like investigate different things, we could you know add in additional terms um, into this list here. Um, which would let us 
um, start to understand how does the model change when we add more trees to it. Um, so that's something I'll, I'll kind of throw out there. I think we do that as an example, but um, I can't remember if we have that exactly set up here. Um, but I think for now, this initial code block is set up just to use one tree and just show the cross validation. Um, so we can see we regenerate some of the um, uh, numerical error metrics and then we'll plot again below. Um, oh yeah, it looks like we do then also include a, a, a comparison to um, what happens when we add more, we just look at one example, what happens when we add maybe 50 trees to the uh, model. Um, we also turn back on this bootstrapping feature, which is one of the, the things that really makes uh, random forest um, work uh, a lot better uh, than just decision trees. Um, and so we'll show what that looks like as well. Um, and I can talk through if there's interest to the kind of details uh, here also, um, but I think we can just kind of show that off for this example. Um, so we do that uh, fitting there with 50 trees, um, and then we plot these two side by side again. Um, so here's the original model that we started with, um, which is one tree, and here's the model when we added 50 trees to it. Um, so <clears throat> In this case, the, the performance on the test data, um, again, we're just looking at the test data in this case because as we said before, the training data doesn't really tell us too much. Um, the test data uh, error improves you know, pretty dramatically, um, especially these really like large errors at the higher end. Um, and then, yeah, for a few of the metrics, you know, the, the MAE value here specifically, you know, drops from 0 0.68 down to 0 0.47. So it improves by you know, a third or so. Um, and I think that that was everything we had set up. Yeah, it was. Um, so again, the, the key points, this was a, some extra stuff I added on kind of at the end that I thought was interesting. But the key point that um, to really take away for the assessment, um, I think it was really in the, the first example here. Um, that I scroll back up, scroll back up to thinking about your know, training data and testing data, um, looking at um, you know, how the model performs on these different uh, subsets of the data. Um, and there's a few questions which I think I missed a second ago, so I'll circle back up. Yeah, so I can explain in more detail the, the K-fold cross-validation. I kind of added that in the end and I, I didn't explain that very well. Um, so what I'm gonna do, what I think would maybe be useful um, is, again, pointing out some resources um, because we're using the methods from scikit-learn, I'll just pull out there. Um, they have a nice example, um, not in the documentation here, but let's see if I can get to the link I'm thinking of. Um, oops. Let's do just, let's maybe this link. Yeah, so here's the visual example that they give that I think is kind of useful. Um, so the idea behind the like K-fold cross-validation is that, um, well, as they set it up, they have this like combined structure here. So maybe I'll explain the way that, that Scikit-Learn kind of does their definition of it. Um, so they have their, their whole data set at the, at the top. Um, we're kind of moving from the top to the bottom here. Um, they split off training data and test data, just like we did in our example. Um, within the training data, rather than just doing like one training on all of that data together, um, they break that up further into um, what they call folds. Um, that's just, uh, again, random subsets of the training data. Um, so in this case, they're showing an example that would be referred to as five-fold cross-validation, uh, meaning there's just you know, five uh, splits within the training data. When we make these splits, then we train um, five different versions of the model, um, each of them on different subsets of the folds. Um, so it's shown here, they kind of, you should read like row by row from top to bottom. So split one is saying we train on two, three, four, and five and we use fold one as temporary test data. Um, then we train a separate model on fold one, three, four, and five and, train, and test on two. And then we do the same thing, you know, holding out fold three, then we hold out fold four, and then we hold out fold, fold five. 
And so from each of those steps, there's you know five different versions of the model. Um, and then you like recombine all of the um, error metrics on each of the folds. Um, so if you think about adding fold one, two, three, four, and five together, then that gives us a set of assessment metrics for the entirety of the training data set. So if you do that process from top to bottom, um, you have an assessment that you did where all of the training data got to be like temporary test data. Um, and so you have an assessment of your model without having to look at your actual test data. Um, the reason you might want to do that, um, and what they point out here is this like final evaluation step is oftentimes we want to iterate very, very heavily on like the type of model we're using, the specific setup of that model, um, like all these like optimization steps we might do. Um, so we want something that we can iterate over and over and over again without looking at test data. Because if we just do this single split, if we didn't do any of this cross-validation here, if we just had you know this one split at the top and we just tuned the model over and over and over to this test data, we run into a, a separate situation where the, the model will not generalize well to like the actual real world because what we really did is we just found the best model for doing this specific set of test data. That was again, just like a random subset. Um, and so that's not actually like the best practice that we have. So the idea with doing cross-validation is we get to isolate a little bit more um, between the two. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone um, for coming. We have five minutes left or so. Um, and I don't wanna go over time because I know we've been going a long time. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up there. I just wanna throw a few things um, just as we're wrapping up as, as kind of reminders, um, I think I had a closing slide somewhere. Um, there's some bonus slides in here if you're like looking through for like training and decision trees. Um, but yeah, what I wanted to just throw out as reminders, um, tomorrow morning, if you have any specific questions, you know, please show up. Um, we can talk through in detail. We can look through any results, ask any specific questions. Um, again, because I know a bunch, a lot of us are, you know, grad students or, or um, postdocs, if you're like having specific research questions or you're like, is this going to work? I have an idea. Um, I'm happy to give you my thoughts and, and work through anything. Um, so um, I'd, I'm happy to see you all there tomorrow. Um, and the last thing, oops, uh, hopefully before too many people hop out, I do have a quick like feedback form specifically for the day one activities. If there's anything um, that worked well, didn't work well, um, any feedback specifically on these activities, I'd love to um, hear that. Uh, so please, um, if you can take a second to fill out that Google form. Um, and this link here, which was the other one I had, let me just double check what that was. Oh, this is just to the agenda document. Um, so again, if you're like looking for links, oh, not accepting responses, ooh. All right, give me just a second. <laughs> I'll do this on my other monitor so I don't dox myself too much. Um, but I'll go update that link really quick. I wonder if I accidentally clicked a button that uh, limited the dates. Um, but I'll stop sharing here um, and I will get that set up um, for everyone to fill out here. Um, but other than that, I think that is everything I had for day one. So hopefully we'll catch y'all again uh, tomorrow for day two. We'll be talking through again, image data, uh, neural networks, convolutional neural networks, um, everything to hopefully um, get us started on that. Um, so yeah, let me update here. Daily feedback and okay. So that is turned back on. That should be accepting responses now. So yeah, thank you for letting me know on that. Um, so that link should work in chat. Let me just grab that again. One more time. Um, and if anyone has any like last questions and you want to hang out afterwards, I'll stay in the call for another 10 minutes or so. Um, but otherwise, I think that's everything I have. So yeah, thanks y'all for coming and we'll catch you tomorrow.